everyone. Please take your seats as this event is about to begin. Thank you. Please take your seats. We're about to begin. Hello and welcome to Educating the Next Generation of Climate Leaders. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage Daniel Dominguez of Colorado State University. I'm Daniel Dominguez. Thank you for joining us for our panel and educating the next generation of climate leaders. I would now like our panelists to join us on the stage. I'd like to start by introducing myself. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran. I'm also a Marshall Scholar at Cardiff University, which is a program that helps collaborate between the U.S. and U.K. governments. I'm also a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow at Colorado State University and first-generation American in the United States. As part of the Youth Environmental Alliance in Higher Education, we are committed to experiential learning, expanded participation, and opportunities to engage in climate action. It's my pleasure to be joined by four distinct colleagues. By four distinct colleagues. And we will also be hearing pre-recorded remarks by Dr. Brandon Jones from the National Science Foundation. I would now like the panelists to introduce themselves and please describe your journey to climate action and education. Hello, everyone. Testing? Hello everyone, my name is Rose Daly. I'm a PhD student at Michigan Technological University studying environmental engineering. Similar to Daniel, I am also a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. My journey to climate action began during my undergraduate at Michigan Tech. I joined the Alternative Energy Enterprise Program, which is a program designed for students. It's voluntary and students can propose a community project to work on during their time at Michigan Tech. And in exchange for working on the project, they are given credits to count toward their degree. So I joined a renewable energy enterprise, and along with my mentor, we proposed a project that is now Michigan Tech's highest profile project on campus. It is the Sustainability Demonstration House. Through this project, we are retrofitting a 1950s 5,000 square foot home into a net zero energy, zero waste, fully sustainable residence. And we are using this house as a tool to educate our community on green building design and sustainable living. 
It's through this project that my interest in community sustainability was sparked and this kind of paved the way for me into my climate change work. Hello, good morning. My name is Ellen Stofan. I'm the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian. You know, my path to climate action, I can guarantee, is not the same as anybody's in this room. I'm a planetary geologist and I study the planet Venus. And early in my career, people would say to me, well, greenhouse effect isn't real. And I'm like, let me introduce you to Venus, where it's 500 degrees centigrade on the surface because of a runaway greenhouse. But now I'm at the Smithsonian, and we're really excited um, to be announcing this week that we're rolling out a whole program at the Smithsonian called Life on a Sustainable Planet, where we're bringing together all of the resources of the Smithsonian, culture, art, history, science, to really address climate action now. And one of the most important parts of this is going to be education. Testing. Hey, how y'all doing? My name is uh, Daniel Briggs. Good morning. Um, I'm a Colorado State Master's student in the Ecosystem Sustainability Program. Um, uh, I uh, just left the Marine Corps after about eight and a half years as, a, as an officer, uh, aviation maintenance officer. So my path to uh, climate education uh, was that route, um, military first. Um, prior to that, my uh, undergrad was in criminal justice. So pretty new to the climate education space and uh, just excited to be here. And uh, my lab, we study uh, pollinator decline at the national parks. This, this past summer, um, visited about five or six national parks and did bee and butterfly surveys for the uh, National Park Service. So thank you. Hi, my name is Leah Dundon. I'm on the faculty at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm the director of the Vanderbilt Climate Change Initiative, and my research focuses on infrastructure resilience and marine shipping decarbonization, and also climate change education. Um, and my path to climate action really came from, I'm an environmental lawyer by background, and I did a mid-career PhD, and during that program, I took a class, a climate change class, and that truly inspired the rest of my story. So uh, here's to education and good teaching. Thank you all. I would now like to begin our panel. The Youth Environmental Alliance Network encompasses students from across the globe, all with unique experiences. Personally, I grew up in the inner city of San Diego having no connection to our natural environment, even though it was less than a mile away. That was until I joined the Marine Corps and I started hiking. Although it wasn't the most pleasurable experience at first, it did help me begin to form that connection with my natural environment. I went on to continue to, to do that and then eventually helped me form my connection and move to climate education. I quickly realized how much water drives our society, and I felt overwhelmed and chose that as my cause. I have also ex done a lot of experiential learning through South Africa, the national park systems, and two years ago, hiking the burnt fires of Colorado after the biggest wildfire in the United States. I would now like to ask our students, Rose, Dan, how do you feel about your role in climate education? whether it be in higher education or high school. Are graduate students being prepared for a world that is vastly different from even a decade ago? Uh, yes, I do believe uh, that the world is uh, preparing our students for a uh, fastly developing world um, in climate education. Um, the, uh, the space that I'm in um, as a new master's student, um, I'm a, also a first generation student, uh, college student. Um, and I can say that throughout my first semester um, at Colorado State, I've received nothing but the, the best mentoring from my advisor. And um, the, the, the opportunities for field work are like second to none. I really can't you know, ask for anything better. So I think that as long as we continue that trend of giving our students the opportunity to have that experiential learning foundation to really cement the, the knowledge that they gain from coursework, um, then we'll be continuing to produce a uh, uh, a ready and uh, accessible uh, climate leadership force. Yeah, so when I think back to high school, I don't recall ever being exposed to the issue of climate change. I was familiar with the buzzwords, but in the classroom, 
this issue never came up and the science and facts behind it were never discussed at all. So I wasn't really exposed to the climate change issue until my undergrad at Michigan Tech. And something really cool about going to a STEM school is that sustainability was incorporated into all my engineering courses. So for example, I would learn how to design a water treatment system and then toward the end of the semester we would learn what emissions come out of this system? What is the LCA of a water treatment system? How can we reduce the energy usage and thus the greenhouse gas emissions of this plant? So I'm really fortunate that Michigan Tech has sustainability and climate change incorporated into our core classes. And it's not just for me as an environmental engineer. I've spoken to many friends who are electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, and they also have sustainability integrated into their curriculum. So that has been really wonderful. However, I truly think that my broader climate change education came from outside the classroom through grassroots organizations on Michigan Tech's campus. I think a lot of students can relate to this, that we learn about climate advocacy with other students that we join forces with on campus. We form our grassroots groups, we lay our foundation, and we educate each other and the community on um, climate change and sustainability. Thank you both for your remarks. I would now like to hear from the National Science Foundation and Dr. Brandon Jones. Hello. Uh, this is Brandon Jones with the National Science Foundation. Uh, on behalf of the Directorate for Geosciences at NSF, we just want to say um, we're excited to be partnering with so many different institutions and so many different uh, groups in supporting our next generation of climate leaders. Uh, many of the programs that I manage here in the Geosciences Directorate at NSF focus on developing and preparing early career scholars uh, for the myriad of uh, occupations and positions that exist right now in the earth system sciences. And there are uh, no positions in my mind uh, that are more important than those related to addressing uh, the impacts of climate change and a, a changing uh, climate here on planet earth. And uh, many of the young people, the students, the scholars that are right there at COP27 uh, have been supported by the programs here at NSF. And we are so excited that there are current students there uh, that are ready to engage in the, in the negotiations and the discussions um, as it relates to solution creation around climate change. But we're also excited that many alumni from these programs are also involved and have gone on to become leaders at, on the international level uh, as it relates to climate change. Um, solution creation and uh, addressing all the issues that uh, a change in climate has brought to bear here on planet Earth. So um, again, on behalf of NSF, we are excited that you all are there, that you all are ready to uh, take on this challenge of climate change. We're excited to be able to have supported you all, um, and we are looking forward to the great things that you all will come up with to help humanity deal with the greatest threat uh, in human history to the human population. Um, so again, good luck with the meeting. Um, we're excited to continue to support and partner with you and uh, go ahead and do great things. All right. I just wanna thank Dr. Brandon Jones and the National Science Foundation. I know Rose and I are personally sponsored by them as I'm sure many of you have through your careers. So as someone has studied in the US, Scotland, and now Wales, I feel like I've been able to perceive different degree paths in each institution. At Colorado State, I felt more in a cabin where I was supposed to be taking certain courses when and I studied watershed science. And there are so many inputs that go into watershed. Pollinators, the understory, forest, wildfires, there's so much. And my degree wasn't able to cover all that. 
So I had to go out and work with the staff at my college, and luckily they were able to advocate on my behalf, on, the, on my interests. However, in the UK, I'm seeing that I am just more easily able to do that by myself. It's more, it's more geared towards self-study and for your own, pursu your own pursuits, and I, which I think may encourage interdisciplinary studies in general. To our educators, what do you think are some of the challenges in climate education and the changes that are needed to implement them? You know, climate education, as you say, it is a challenge because right now the problems that are facing us are truly multidisciplinary. They're interdisciplinary. They're transdisciplinary, all those words. Because when you're trying to understand an ecosystem, you really need to understand all the different parts of it. And what we're seeing around the world, you remove certain species out of an ecosystem, you remove certain plants out of an ecosystem because of climate change. And the effects are ones we don't always, that aren't necessarily apparent or ones that we can instantly understand. So the fact that you do have to sort of be a jack of all trades means that we need to have a lot of flexibility. It's more about learning how to learn than it is memorizing huge amounts of facts because the facts are changing on the ground. And so what we need are people like the students we've got here up on the stage today who've really gone and looked at I need to get a specialty, but I really need to be curious around the, about the world around me, and I really need to try to get the information that I need to solve problems that I see in front of me. And frankly, with me working with students, one of the main challenges I always find is what's the problem you're trying to solve? Um, if you can really clearly articulate the problem you're trying to solve, it, it becomes a lot easier and you can go find the information you need. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and the interdisciplinary part of that is really important and particularly challenging for universities to accomplish um, because the reward structure and the incentive structures at universities are really set up by departments that focus on a particular discipline. And so if you want to go outside that discipline and, and do more interdisciplinary work, you're not going to really necessarily be rewarded um, or necessarily meet your requirements for tenure or whatever else in your department. Each department will say, well, how does that help ec economists or how does that help science or whatever the department is. Um, so I think, you know, out of the box thinking on how we reward and incentivize interdisciplinary work, right now it's incredibly, I mean, it's going great. The YAD network is, is a one really good example of that. Um, but it takes a lot of voluntary effort. And as Dr. Jones just mentioned, um, the NSF is really doing a wonderful job supporting some of this work, this transdisciplinary work. Um, the other challenge I see is that it's mostly a self-selected population. So when you go to college, you don't actually have to learn anything about climate change if you don't want to. But like all the panelists have said, and Dr. Jones mentioned, there's not going to be a career that's not impacted by climate change. There's not going to be an area, whether you're an artist, an economist, a banker, anything, um, you need to know something about climate change, in my view, just to be an, a, an educated global citizen and U.S. citizen. Um, so having core requirements that, re that require you to graduate with at least some basic understanding of the, of the magnitude of the problem of climate change, I think is a really important um, change. And, and one of the barriers to implementing that is that making curriculum changes in universities is challenging. Um, you know, they've done things for the same way for a very long time. It's been successful at a lot of schools, so it's hard to, it's hard, it's, it's hard to train, change entrenched systems, um, as we know, even being here working on this major problem. Um, and so I think we also need support from the highest levels in universities. If, if that comes, I think it's much easier to make those interdisciplinary incentive changes and getting um, climate into core curriculums. So it really needs to have the support at the absolute highest levels of the university. But those are, um, I think, some really important uh, issues in education. Yeah, and I don't want to forget K through 12 education because, for example, the Smithsonian has curriculum around the global goals. It's really important that we start at the youngest levels, really teaching kids in an age-appropriate way what the challenges are that this planet is facing. And one of the things that research has shown over and over again is that if you kids give kids paths to optimism, if you give them paths to hope, there are solutions out there and you can be part of the solution. And if you weave that through curriculum, um, this idea of optimism and hope and problem solving, uh, 
you know, to me, that's going to have the biggest effect. So it needs to go all the way through the educational system. Thank you both for your comments. Just to build on that, Dr. Dunnan, what role does education play in broadening participation and perspectives of climate education to ensure all talent can contribute to climate solutions? Well, you know, one of the things we're really focused on at the Smithsonian is, is how do we bring in all kids? So we're about to launch this major initiative, Life on a Sustainable Planet, and communicating science to the public, but even more importantly, engaging kids in science. So how are we going to produce um, curriculum? For example, uh, we're about to work, start work on some curriculum around resilience. What does resilience mean? How do you teach kids about resilience? We're working, again, on curriculum on global goals. But even beyond that, we have citizen science opportunities. We have a program where we have kids going out and looking at nests in their backyard as part of the global bird migratory problem. So this idea of getting kids to realize they're part of nature, they're part of the natural system, giving them hands-on experiences, because, again, research has shown that's what actually gets the kids engaged, is having them do something, not just read about something. So weaving that through experiences, I think, is really, really critical. Uh, and then, of course, following through. It's a pipeline, and we've got to keep kids in the climate education pipeline. And so at the Smithsonian, we offer internships. We have over 3,000 interns a year. Um, and I've got some great candidates, I think, here in the audience uh, for future interns. So mostly undergrads, over 3,000 come to the Smithsonian. And some of them, even at high school level, through the Natural History Museum, we've got programs. And so this idea of giving kids experiences, giving them actual hands-on to keep them in that pipeline um, to lead towards future jobs, I think, is really critical. Thank you for that. Dr. Dunnan, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, so actually, we are about to launch something called the Climate Leaders Academy that was uh, supported directly by the NSF that will hopefully broaden access and do everything that we are talking about here on this stage. Um, the idea is to bring students together from a number of different universities across the country, from different backgrounds, really tap into the talent that exists in so many different places in the country, um, and give them this experiential education, not just the didactic lecture in the classroom, um, but engage them with mentorship, um, with uh, experiences at COP, uh, and we really couldn't have done that without the funding from the National Science Foundation. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, and then the, the K-12 comment you made, I think, is really, really important. The, um, some of the re review comments we got back from the NSF were, how are you going to link this to K-12? And so we're really excited to have our students in this new program doing projects that they will then be needing to engage with K-12 in you know, a myriad of ways. It could be going into the classroom. It could be engaging with the leadership in K-12 administration, um, but helping bring you know, climate optimism, climate understanding into the K-12 area. Um, so that, that program will be uh, launching in, in mid-applications will be available in mid-spring. Um, look for it on the YEA Network website. And uh, it'll be application only, um, but we're really excited to hopefully broaden access and tap into that talent that exists all over. Thank you. Rose, do you have anything to add from a student perspective? Yeah, so from a student's perspective, thinking about college, this is one of the most important parts in the life of our youth. This is where they will discover their passions and define their career path. So we, of course, want our students to choose a path that incorporates uh, fighting for climate justice. That is what we want because like Leah mentioned in their future career You can't avoid the issue of climate change. You will be working in it in some aspect So one of the ways we can ensure our students are prepared for that is by bringing climate change both into the classroom and outside of the classroom so incorporating Sustainability into our classes and then also introducing these opportunities that Ellen and Leah mentioned these internships these collaborative academies We need our students to be joining and uh, joining these opportunities whenever they can to further their knowledge And once we give the students the knowledge they are then empowered to fight for climate justice even before their career begins Thank you all for your comments I would now like to post an open question to all the panel what concrete steps can be taken to enhance climate education? And what is the role of students in making these changes happen, both on their campus and beyond? 
Sure, I'll start with that, um, that one. So I think today students in the U.S. have more power on their campuses than probably ever before in terms of moving the administration to act. And recent headlines in the U.S., um, you may have noticed that petitions and writing letters um, actually have an impact. Universities are clamoring for your tuition dollars and your federal loan dollars, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but you have, you have a lot, they, they listen to you. Um, so I think one concrete step is getting concerted um, action in terms of even just writing a letter and getting a lot of students to sign it. Uh, I think you will get, if, if an, an issue comes up where a lot of students are behind something, the administration is likely to listen more today than probably ever before. I think one of the most critical things is ensuring that when you have opportunities like internships, um, that there is some degree of compensation for it. And that institutions like the Smithsonian are working specifically with tribal colleges, um, with HBCUs, to make sure that every kid in the country has an opportunity to get that kind of experience that then allows them to apply to a good graduate school, that then allows them to, to get a job in the future. So making sure that when you offer opportunities, they're truly offered and truly available to everyone. Because we know for climate change, it's really going to take all hands on deck. It's going to take everybody. And right now, science still doesn't look like everybody. We have a lot of work to do. And, and so this idea of ensuring access um, to high-quality STEM education, to high-quality STEM experiences for all kids is something that I think is extremely critical. Climate education mentorship is something that I believe is very uh, critical to uh, success as an uh, incoming climate leader. Um, it's uh, critical because we need mentors who have the experience to provide that foundation for students so they don't so they don't have to reinvent the wheel as they go through their education journey and um, also to provide that platform to be able to innovate and develop new strategies from by capital capitalizing on that uh, invested knowledge that has been uh, gained over time so one thing I look forward to as a uh, master's student and progressing further along in my career is um, being able to pour into um, newer generations and to provide insights that I've gained through my, my studies to, to help ensure that that uh, trend continues. So I can think of two concrete steps um, that I think would be wonderful for the future of climate education. The first is I, I'm thinking back to my freshman year and all, all of us remember those prerequisite classes we had to take as freshmen. And a lot of us couldn't really understand how these classes fit into our career path or into the rest of our time in college. They were just a class we had to take to check a box. And these are just classes that students are annoyed about. They complain about them all the time. So what if we replace these prerequisite classes with a climate change class? So students who are coming into college with maybe little to no knowledge on climate change because of, like I mentioned, I didn't learn anything about climate change in high school, they can have that initial exposure during their freshman year of college. And that will be something they can think about and use as they move up through their junior and senior year and eventually to their career. Um, and I think in addition to that, uh, so previously I mentioned that in my classes there are sustainability topics, but I feel like at this time they're almost like a side dish to the main entree if the class is looked at as a meal. And I would actually like climate change education to become the seasoning on that entree, not to just be a side dish. So now moving outside of the classroom um, and thinking about the administration at universities. So this was brought up by Ellen and Leah, but we really do need a voice in the administration to support the youth and our actions. Um, and we, we need our voices heard, we need resources, we need financial support sometimes, and we just need someone from higher up who can provide that to us. Um, so for example, when I was an undergrad at Michigan Tech, there was no sustainability director. And we youth um, who formed our grassroots organizations, we had to uh, do everything on our own. We worked together, but we never had support from the administration. And we often ran into roadblocks that were preventing us from making progress, simply because our voice wasn't being heard in the upper levels of the university. 
However, when I returned to Michigan Tech as a graduate student, they had hired a sustainability director, and that was a game changer. We now had someone in the higher level of the university who was a voice for us. And now we are able to make progress more quickly and efficiently because we have that support. Thank you all for that. On that note about evolving, as someone who studied natural resources in classes, I always thought it was a little bit weird that we learned about pollinators, burnt landscapes, conservation in the classroom, but rarely ever get opportunities to do that in the field. It wasn't until I was running around the national park systems with the butterfly net collecting pollinators that ecology really clicked for me. It wasn't until I hiked the wildfires of Colorado and burnt landscapes and saw the recovery at the end of the summer to understand how that occurs as a natural system. And it, there's nothing quite like going to South Africa and talking with conservationists about their work on the field. How do you think the field should evolve to cover these topics? I think access to nature for kids of all ages is really critical. And, and so I think programs, um, I know that we have at the Smithsonian citizen science programs that really force kids to get out in their backyard to look because frankly even going in your backyard and doing a mini bio blitz shows you millions of things that live there that you never even knew existed so if we can keep experiences whether you live in a city or whether you live in a country of connecting kids to the environment around them it will bring them closer to nature and then i think programs that really try to bring kids out in experiences out to rivers in their community to parks in their community are just really critical because it is that connection. You feel separated, but humans are a part of the ecological system and we need to really make sure that's experienced. Yeah, just on that note, I remember when I was in fifth or sixth grade in California, they bust us all out to Yosemite National Park and it was the first time I'd just seen a forest and I was just like overwhelmed with joy at being out there for a week and taking natural classes. Does the rest of the panel have anything to add? Um, so on that note, uh, so last year I lived in Costa Rica and I worked as a research affiliate at an institute there. And I spent a lot of my time at a local bilingual K-12 school um, building a water treatment system for them. And I got to observe the students uh, all the way from kindergarten through their senior year on this campus almost on a daily basis. And I uh, just noticed how the environment is integrated into their curriculum. So instead of sitting in a classroom and learning about science, they got to go on a hike in the cloud forest and look at the insects, the predator-prey relationships, the fungi, the plants. Like Ellen was saying, we need our students to be outside and seeing these firsthand and having those hands-on experience. During lunch, I would watch the kids compost their own food scraps. I would see the kindergartners tend to the chickens that lived on campus. Um, the classes would collaboratively work together to build gardens out of tires and old um, roofing materials, and they would grow veggies in there and enjoy them all year round. And I just want to see a lot more of that in our K-12 schools here in the United States so that our students, when they do enter college, when they do enter their careers, they're ready to fight for climate justice. Yeah, I just want to add that um, the, the UNFCCC, the underlying treaty that's the reason we're all here today, was signed by President, the first President George Bush, um, a Republican president. And my understanding, I, I didn't obviously personally observe this, but my understanding is that one thing that really moved him to do that was he engaged with the scientists and actually went on tours of the Arctic ice. So having that personal experience, I think, is really important, not only for you know, kindergartners all the way up to our, the top, top leaders. Uh, yeah, I, I can... Uh... Couldn't have said it better than the, the rest of the panelists on the stage. Um, I'll speak for myself. Um, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, not a lot of access to nature or trails or, you know, things of that sort. So um, and it was a pretty rough neighborhood. So my mother was quite reluctant to let me go outside oftentimes because there might be gunshots and certain things going on. But uh, I remember uh, I would be allowed to go into the backyard and play or whatever and those uh, early experiences I recall of like catching toads in the yard um, and being able to interact with it, hold it, put it in a jar, feed it crickets, um, in turn triggered me to seek out material on 
bugs and tarantulas and uh, birds of prey and, you know, just triggered me into, like, retaining all of this types of information that would later on follow me. I didn't go into an undergrad degree that related to it, but circled back to this whole field um, after having served in the military, but had to, you know, dive back into those early memory banks of, you know, being a kid in the backyard getting dirty. So, you know, I think that's uh, critical to what uh, Dr. Stofan was saying was about making it relatable so that we do see ourselves as part of the ecosystem and we don't see ourselves as uh, separate from it. Thank can you all. I, can I just add one more thing to that? Um, listening to you talk made me realize that, you know, I don't think we do a good enough job of explaining to sort of average everyday Americans how what happens here impacts their lives. Um, so being able to kind of name some concrete things when you go back to your communities that, that are that can explain to people why this, what happens here, really matters to them. Like that the charging infrastructure that's down the street from their house is there because of the promises that we made here at COP that are now funded in the Inflation Reduction Act. That's just one, one of many examples. But being able to really put some concrete um, uh, names to things that happen here that impact local communities at home, I think is important. Thank you for that. We actually have a bit, little bit of time. So on that note, to the rest of the panel, how do you think the decisions here at COP affect the people back home? Uh, the decisions here at COP create the framework that we all play in. It creates the playground, the sandbox that we all have to abide by. And so the uh, discussions here uh, are more critical than we can probably anticipate or even capture in words. Um, yeah dictates the future, it dictates the, the fight and how difficult the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years are, so. Yeah. yeah, I think when you see people walking out onto the bed of the Mississippi River and when you see the heat waves that have affected the United States, the world, you see the wildfires that are happening around the world. It's on us as Leah said, to really go back and communicate that the decisions that we're making here are to prevent that from getting worse. It's to help turn that around so that we really can have sustainable life on this planet. And so what's happening here is really critical to the future of everyone. And we've got to take that message back. And the other piece that I think is really important that I see happening here a lot is around environmental justice and how so much of what's happening with climate is affecting people around the world who are the least able to deal with it. And taking those discussions back to communities to know the global south is affected by emissions that they did not cause. So it's on all of us to really help fix that. Rose, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think the panel summed it up really well. I think we need to communicate within our communities. I know sometimes the climate change issue can just seem overwhelming and we don't know where to start. But we can always start with our community and we can start with small actions and small initiatives. We can start by giving opportunities to the youth and to other members of our community and working collectively um, while these bigger decisions are being made, maybe out of our reach. Well, thank you all. That concludes our panel. Today we heard a lot about experiential learning, interdisciplinary work, multiple pathways, and the, all, all the new initiatives that can help support this work. I would now like to open the, the floor for questions. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Meyer here. I'm a vice president of a nonprofit called North American Young Generation in Nuclear. And uh, education about energy and climate change is huge for us. We have children's books, we have drawing contests, essay contests, we go to schools and talk to them. But in the education system, I still see renewables and non renewables, even though nuclear is the second largest or the first largest source of clean energy in America. So how, do you have any tips for how we discuss these emotional topics such as climate change or nuclear? How do we promote education um, from your experience? What have you found that works the best? Thank you. 
Well, at the Smithsonian, you know, we've long tackled really tough and controversial subjects. So when it comes to climate change, for example, um, standing behind you is the director of the National Museum of Natural History, <laughs> Kirk Johnson, <laughs> where we have an amazing exhibit called Deep, T Deep Time, where when we talk to the public about climate change, we put it in the context of how this planet has operated over its four and a half billion year history and how crises have happened throughout. We stick to the science. We say what's happening. We lay out why the scientific case is convincing, what the evidence is. And then we give pathways for future action. And so I think it's really important because there's so much misinformation and disinformation out there that when it comes to what are our choices around energy, what are our choices around materials of the future, what are our choices to really get to planetary sustainability, we've got to get the facts out there in a clear way. But frankly, that's not enough because we know there's lots of facts out there. And so the importance, I think, of storytelling, of going to trusted sources like the Smithsonian um, is, is really tough, but it's a huge problem out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, nuclear is a tough one because it, you know, it came about from um, essentially destruction and violence of the war. Um, I grew up in the 80s, as everyone in my generation did, and um, it was, you know, it was a, it was a decade of fear of at any moment we could have a nuclear disaster. We were all kind of living under that. Um, but it's also about lack of knowledge. So that's, I was afraid until I started taking some nuclear engineering classes, and then I was like excited about the possibilities that nuclear really offers. I mean, in the decarbonization work we're doing, we're talking about the future potential of you know small modular reactors on board ships, um, you know, powering all over the country. It's uh, it's an incredible source of energy. Um, but w one thing you know we often don't think about is within five years during World War II, we went from knowing almost nothing about the atom to having not only the bomb but the ability to power entire cities in five years. That's incredible, and it was because we just said we're doing this. Here's endless amounts of money. Go, um, and we did that with the moon, and we can do that with climate change. So I think we just need to get really excited about the technologies that we already have and um, put the resources behind it. So we, at Vanderbilt, we do um, outreach into the, into the lower middle schools and high schools on nuclear engineering. Um, and you know, there's, I'm sure you've seen the mousetrap uh, sort of hands-on activity where you put a ton of mousetraps out there with a ping pong ball in them and you throw one ping pong ball and then they all go off. And that's kind of a, a good example of how nuclear energy works. But, um, I think the experiential part of getting kids engaged early in the knowledge and maybe um, assuaging some of that fear that, <clears throat> that is really tied in particular to, to nuclear. Thank you. Is there another question? Hi, everyone. So my name is Eugene Brown for Michigan Tech. And this is not a question, but I think it relates to making climate issues interdisciplinary because at Michigan Tech, I feel like that's one of the things that we do so well. I came in as a PhD in humanities and I've had the opportunity to take courses in climate policy. And I also have the privilege to teach writing and every year we pick themes that we make students write on and climate change and climate issues is one of the things that our students are happy to write about and that's in a writing program. So I think that is something that's really doable and I will encourage all other universities to probably uh, follow our lead because we are doing well with that. Thank you for that. I'm Kathy Bunting Howarth from Cornell University in New York Sea Grant. And for the students, we've talked a lot about K-12 education and what's inspired you. What helpful hints do you have for the other students and myself in the audience um, about how to talk about climate change with your family and friends when you're hanging out, eating pizza, maybe it's Thanksgiving dinner, best practices. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, so I think those conversations need to happen. Uh, and if we need to be the ones to initiate them, then that's how it will be. <laughs> And I think we need to start with facts, um, but we don't want to be aggressive in our conversations. I'm thinking about conversations I have with family members about uh, switching to a plant-based diet, because that's sometimes a sensitive topic for a lot of people. 
and we just need to um, find a way to appeal to our family members, uh, figure out what they're passionate about, and kind of appeal to their passion. And we can have effective conversations that way. And again, we want to come from a place of love for each other, love for the earth, and the fact that we are a community. We're not against each other in this fight. We're fighting it together. Um, so appeal to them and stick to facts and knowledge, and you'll have a great conversation from there. Yeah. Dan? Yeah, I would say um, demonstration. Um, so leading by example, first and foremost, uh, always sets the tone. Um, might also set the tone for being mocked by your family, depending on, like, you know, <laughs> you're like the baby in the family and they like to rip you or whatever. But, uh, yeah, I would say um, that's, that's <laughs> definitely the, the, the starting point. And then from there, I think being understanding and being conscious of, you know, not being preachy or not being judgmental, um, but also understanding it's about exposure. And, you know, for myself, I can say that I'm here today because I was exposed to certain things at key points and key times in my life that allowed me to then make different decisions, certain decisions versus other decisions I could have made. So, you know, if, if, if you have family members that you love and you love them for who they are, understanding that they just don't, may not have the same exposure or they may not be as receptive to the things that you were exposed to in the same way so it may just need to be related to them in a way that they can digest and that they can understand so you know to kind of jump off of what uh, Rose is saying you know making it relatable to their experience um, and being that uh, empathic understanding um, just well-rounded decent human being to them so yeah. all right thank you all Thank you all. Um, young climate entrepreneur, so I'm really curious about mentorship and how important mentorship is in climate action. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, do our students want to start? Sure. So uh, I kind of had mentioned throughout the talk that I had a climate mentor, which I'm so fortunate that he was part of my college education. And I truly believe that if I didn't have my mentor, I wouldn't be on the stage today. He's the one who really kind of opened the door to me to start exploring sustainability and getting involved on my campus. Um, I mentioned that we founded the Sustainability Demonstration House. He was like, I need you to lead this project. And I was thrown into it. And I was like, OK, I need to organize a massive house project, figure out how we can use it to educate the community. Um, move students into the house who will live here and live a sustainable lifestyle. I was thrown into this, but looking back, I'm so happy that I just had someone kind of like, you know, kick me in the pants and say, go do this. And that's where I truly discovered my passion for community sustainability, and that's what brought me to where I am today. So I'm forever grateful for my mentor, and I think more students should seek out these mentors, or maybe the mentors can seek out the students as well. Yeah, um, my mentor is like my gasoline to my fire, essentially. Like, wouldn't be here without her. Um, just uh, she takes the, the, the raw interest I have in whatever it may be, and she provides the, okay, if you're into that, then you need to do this, that I would not readily think of because I just don't have that exposure. I don't have the experiences. I don't have the wide breadth of knowledge. So, I mean human beings were a species that learns I think best from the benefit of having someone who's gone before you and can come back and tell you like hey don't eat that plant because it'll kill you um, so it's uh, you know it's something that you can't uh, underestimate so I think it's uh, absolutely critical thank you for that we heard a lot about new initiatives this climate mentorship become part of that Yes, absolutely. So the New Climate Leaders Academy, um, mentorship is an absolutely key part of it. Uh, students really need to feel that they belong, that they matter, and have someone to sort of guide them. Um, uh, you know, through whether it's coming to COP and being prepared for that, or just simply career choices, um, looking at papers, providing personal advice, knowing that somebody who is above you in terms of experience and, and years cares can make a really big difference whether a student succeeds or not. Um, and so the Climate Leaders Academy will actually be a, you know, having a formal mentor program. Um, we're all going to be trained in mentor leadership some, from some of the established NGOs that do mentor training. 
and uh, each student that comes into the program will be assigned a, a mentor. Um, but also mentors obviously also develop informally. So sometimes you know, we're gonna really take account of the fact that the, the mentor we may have assigned a student ends up not being the correct fit and uh, be very flexible to make sure that each student is feeling supported and like they belong and they matter. And I, I will say to everyone in this room, you should have four or five people you're mentoring. I don't, I don't care what age you are, um, because it's really critical that you are always offering help, support to each other and to other people, because that kind of positive affirmation of just listening to someone and saying you're doing the right thing or have you thought about this is really critical. And at any given time, I usually have five or six people that I'm mentoring, and I just think it's something that everybody needs to be doing all the time. Thank you all for that. Uh, question in the front. Uh, question in the back. Hi, um, David Cummins with Blue Sky Time Coalition. Um, it it strikes me that the title of your talk, which is great by the way, it's really really good stuff, was the evolution of climate learning, and we're out of time. I'm thinking more of the revolution of climate learning, and in that sense. Can you give me your biggest radical out-of-the-box idea of how we can <clears throat> completely change the nature of how we approach education and work between industry and academia? You know, for example, we're trying to start up some areas where industry might co-locate on universities, where part of what the students do is get credit for doing real work, learning accounting, business, STEM types of things while they're getting college degrees. But what's your biggest idea of how we can just revolutionize this? You know, my, my biggest idea, which I've, I've dabbled with but have not succeeded in implementing, um, there are tons of people out there doing great things. And wouldn't it be cool if somehow we could use the power of the Internet to connect all those great things together? I mean, there's loads of internship programs. There's loads of companies doing great things. There's tons of good ideas. But you'd have to wander around and listen to 400 talks here today to get them together. And how do we use the power of the internet so that we can find a way for action, for education, for experience for kids? And we've got to be able to do it. Yeah, that's a really good and difficult question. Um, you know, I, I, it brings to mind Oxford University, which literally has a wall around it because the idea was you want to bring people into this community of learning and isolate them from the rest of the world deliberately so that they can learn together. And there is value in that, but I think the world has really changed and we actually probably need to take down some of the walls that separate universities from their communities and from the rest of the world. Um, and so I think, engage, like, you, like you said, engaging the real world organizations, NGOs, government, industry with universities and even high school students early on so that they get an idea of what, what what do people do in this particular job or that particular job and where am I going to find my inspiration and that they can find they can do that and be exposed to a lot of the real world jobs and the things that they might be doing along the way um, so yeah. Yeah. Rose you're at the end of your PhD is there anything you would want to revolutionize going through the experience again yeah, so kind of to relate to what everyone else is saying, I really think the more hands-on experience we can offer these students, the better. I don't know what exactly that would look like if it's, you know, everyone has to have some sort of internship during their time at college um, or study abroad or join a student organization, but that is where I truly uh, gained all of my knowledge on climate education and where I was able to become a leader in my community. It was outside of the classroom, 100%. So the more hands-on experience we can offer these students, the better. And I, I love your idea of you know, working with industries and just getting more exposure in the real world. Because like we said, do we want our first graders to learn about science in the classroom or to go into their backyards and look at it firsthand? I, I just want to add one example I just thought of. So law schools do have this model where a, prof a law school professor who's a licensed attorney runs what's called a legal clinic within their law school. And then the law students actually take on real cases, whether the attorney does, but they're not just working for a law firm, they're working with a law professor that's doing real work. So they're kind of getting this 
hybrid where they have a professor so they can ask questions that engage learning in the context of the school environment and academia, but also the practical side of actually handling real world cases. So if we could use that model and um, engage in that way in many different fields so that they're not, we're not totally separating and just sending someone off to an internship, which has a lot of value, of course, but also having the real presence on the campus in their everyday academic lives. Thank you. Dan, do you have anything? Oh, yeah, teach kids outside. Um, I think, um, yeah, we, um, we, we imprint onto some of the dumbest things because we're just so cooped up in our, you know, four, four corners or four walls or whatever. And I think kids, um, the more you expose, the things that you're exposed to over time, you look back and you realize, oh, I have like an emotional connection to this thing. My, my grandmother's house, uh, food, cooking during the holidays or whatever. So you can do that same thing with, with kids and just by exposing them to the outdoors early. Um, and that will help to ensure that you know, what, when they get older and some of these solutions aren't as obvious or they have to develop new and, and devise new and innovative ways, they'll be determined to do so because they care about it. Um, we tend to um, come up with solutions for things that we genuinely care about or we aim to protect the things that we care about. So, so I think that's um, just a very simple way to, to help maybe revolutionize the way we do things. One more question. Oh, I'm Allison Chathar-Chan from Cornell University, and we are the land-grant university for New York State, and there's a land-grant university in every state of the United States, so I want to follow up on Leah's comment about breaking down the walls. Um, I want to ask you if you've worked with your land-grant or with your cooperative extension system. Catherine and I have developed a climate stewards volunteer training program for New York State, is taking climate science out to our communities. I would also encourage you to look at 4-H. Um, your land grants work with youth all the way up to their 20s and then with adults. So um, there should be training for extension in every county in the United States. There should be stronger curriculum in 4-H in every county in the United States. And um, we can, we'd love to be a partner with you on that. The Smithsonian is actually starting a partnership with 4-H that we're really excited about because it's really thinking about how do we, how do we reach kids not just who can afford to come to Washington, D.C. on a trip and visit our museums, but how do we reach kids all of, across the country. So we're talking to both Boys and Girls Clubs and 4-H um, in terms of reaching out. And you can imagine I'm waiting for those relationships to get going, and then I'm going to zoom in with my Life on a Sustainable Planet initiative and... Um, and get them involved in that. Okay, uh, one more question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, good morning. Hi, I'm Delaney. I have one quick remark and then a quick question. Um, so, in response to the lady from Cornell, um, <laughs> my brother's actually an environmental architecture there, so go Big Red. Um, but we have, I'm from Miami, Florida, but we have a lot of family from Tennessee and Mississippi, so deep south. Um, and I'm, they all know that I'm a big climate activist in Miami, so our Thanksgivings are very interesting. And if I had like one piece of advice, it would be to um, first understand their skepticism and where their gaps in knowledge are so that you can kind of help address that. Uh, and then my question for the panel is, um, so I'm a PhD and law student at the University of Miami in an interdisciplinary program. So if you had one suggestion for creating an interdisciplinary um, curriculum or something like that, what would it be? I think one thing at Vanderbilt that really helped um, all the work that we've done in, in, in an inter interdisciplinary sector was something called the Vanderbilt Institute for Energy and the Environment, which, brought, which was a series of every Wednesday morning, um, faculty and graduate students and anyone interested would meet at 8 a.m. Um, from all the different schools who were interested in climate and energy studies. And that really helped to just form relationships across the different schools and really solidify them because every Wednesday at 8 a.m. we were meeting in a room with people from e economics, from anthropology, from English, from the natural and hard sciences, from engineering, um, and we'd have usually one person give a little talk and then we'd go around the room and do updates. And that, that, those meetings were really um, foundational in many things that came out of them, interdisciplinary papers, interdisciplinary books, 
interdisciplinary courses. So I think getting people physically in a room or virtually in a room together from those different fields on a regular, ongoing basis is really important. All right, well, thank you very much. I think that's all our time. Thank you so much to our panelists and the audience. Our next event will be starting here at 1030. them like this, right?
Hello and welcome to the U.S. Center. Our next event, Climate Entrepreneurs Solution Pitch Competition, will start in five minutes here at the U.S. Center at 10.30. Again, the next session here at the U.S. Center will start at 10.30 in five minutes, Climate Entrepreneurs Solution Pitch Competition.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the U.S. Center. In one minute, we're going to begin our event, so please take your seats. Again, we'll be starting our next event here at the U.S. Center in one minute, so please take your seats. Hello and welcome to the U.S. Center and welcome to our event, Climate Entrepreneurs Solution Pitch Competition. It's my honor to invite to the stage for opening remarks and I welcome Special Representative for Global Partnerships, Dorothy McAuliffe. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you all here with us for the Climate Entrepreneurs Solution Pitch Competition, which has been made possible by partners and friends of the Connecting Climate Entrepreneurs Public-Private Partnership. I'm Dorothy McAuliffe, the Special Representative from the Office of Global Partnerships at the United States Department of State. So thank you all for being here this morning. I am truly thrilled to be here today with you all to, to host this pitch event. I've been looking forward to this, and I know uh, the teams behind the scenes have been working hard for months, so thank you to everyone um, for being here. As the Special Representative for Global Partnerships, I lead an office that builds partnerships around the world, providing private and civil sector organizations the opportunity to channel their power and resources to address our shared global challenges. As part of our work, we engage with entrepreneurs at all levels to help connect them to resources and opportunities. We are very proud of our programs that advance entrepreneurship and small business development, creating jobs and opportunities across the globe, all while for furthering America's foreign policy and national security objectives and, tr and creating climate resilience. Today's Climate Entrepreneurs Solution Pitch Competition is part of the Connecting Climate Entrepreneurs Initiative, CCE. My office, along with the Office of Special Envoy, Presidential Envoy Care, uh, for Climate, John Kerry's team, and founding partners GE, LinkedIn, and Salesforce, launched this initiative at COP26 in Glasgow last year. 
Today, we're proud to say that CCE has two new private sector, 10, sorry, 10 new private sector partners, engagements with hundreds of leading climate entrepreneurs from around the globe, and an opportunity to scale our impact like never before. This is the only pitch competition showcase at COP US Pavilion featuring climate solutions ready to scale. Today, we've got the best and the brightest from all across the world uh, here with us this morning. But before we get started, I want to provide an overview of the showcase and how it's gonna work this morning. The pitch competition is not only an avenue to highlight pre-seed climate entrepreneurs that are part of our CCE network, it is a showcase of the U.S. government's commitment to identifying and implementing climate solutions through public-private engagement. Over the next hour, you'll hear from four climate startups from around the world who will pitch their business on this global stage. Two entrepreneurs, two, will win cash prizes generously donated by many, by many of our partners and judges. Also, our entrepreneurs have an opportunity to benefit from follow-on follow -on engagements with each judge. The pitch competition will become an avenue to highlight early stage climate entrepreneurs as well as to showcase USG and our private sector's commitment to identifying and implementing climate solutions. After the entrepreneurs pitch their businesses, our, our judges, who I will introduce in a moment, will exit into the green room to discuss their thoughts, suggestions, and what they might be able to offer to these incredible entrepreneurs. Then the judges will return to the stage and provide feedback and prizes to our entrepreneurs. All right, now I'd like to introduce our, judge, our judges. So I'd like to ask the judges to please come out. Okay, wonderful. Welcome to the stage to our wonderful judges. First, um, I'd like to everyone to have a moment to say hello as I call your name and introduce you. Uh, first, we have Sue Duke, Vice President, Head of Global Policy Policy and Economic Graph, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a founding member of the Connecting Climate Entrepreneur Program, launched at Comp 26. Sue leads LinkedIn's government relations policy and economic graph programs worldwide. Her team partners with local and national governments, as well as some of the world's leading economic institutions, such as the World Bank and the World Economic Forum, to help drive economic opportunity. Sue? Good morning. Uh, you hear me okay? Yep. Good morning, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us along, and uh, can't wait to see all these amazing entrepreneurial products. Great. Thank you so much, Sue. Our third, our other, uh, next judge is Teresa Christopher. Teresa is the head of sustainability at Amazon, where she leads the sustainability, climate, environment, and energy policy team. She has spent over 20 years working on environment and energy policies, and has held se several senior posts in U.S. government, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Department of Congress, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Please say hello, Teresa. Yeah, you have um, to speak. yeah, thanks, Dorothy, and I'm sorry I'm losing my voice, everybody. Thanks, entrepreneurs, for being here. I'm excited to be here with you today. At Amazon, we're very invested, investing in new technologies, and so thrilled to be here. I also want to thank the State Department for putting this on. You guys have been a wonderful partner, and so we look forward to doing more of these events. Um, I'm also thrilled to just say we announced $53 million to a new um, women in Climate Entrepreneur Fund. So I'm thrilled to see so many women here. Um, and so really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Our third judge is Rania Rostrom, is representing GE, representing GE, one of our Connecting Climate Entrepreneur founding partners. Rania is head of communications and marketing for GE International Markets, as well as customer education. Prior to this, Rania was GE's Chief Innovation Officer in the Manat region, managing innovation centers in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the UAE. Rania has more than 25 years of industry experience and is co-author of Mapping the Future of Work in Manat. Thank you very much. Super excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to energize us and inspire us with the solutions for tomorrow. 
and really looking forward to the session. Great, thanks, Danya. So our next ju judge is Mark Cruz. Mark is the general manager for sustainab sustainability solutions at Microsoft's environmental sustainability team, a 22-year veteran of Microsoft. Mark's team oversees Microsoft's sustainability product strategy, customer and partner engagements, and the $1 billion Climate Innovation Fund. Mark? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to have some fun today. Uh, one of the things that I do is oversee our Billion Dollar Innovation Fund. Uh, we've seen 1,800 pitches in the last three years, so I'm excited to make it 1,804. So it'll be fun. Thank you, Mark. And finally, last but not least, Erwin Bupal, founder of the Startups for Sustainability and Development program at Google. Currently, his program is helping a global community of more than 300 startups that are focusing on the sustainable development goals with mentoring, technology, and funding support. Perfect. Hi, everyone. This is Lau. Uh, I'm very excited also to be here. Uh, like Dorothy said, we are supporting hundreds of entrepreneurs that are tackling sustainable development goals like you. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation today, and hopefully we can support you in the long journey ahead. Thank you. All right, so now we begin. Uh, let the competition begin. So we're so excited, and I want to point out that we have three of our entrepreneurs here out of four are women. So I just want to highlight that important point this morning. Uh, first up is Alexis Pascaras, the founding director of Agra Solar Consulting. Alexis is a social scientist and policy specialist with an expertise in agri solar solutions. She's on a mission to advance innovation at the Food Energy Water Nexus by creating synergy between solar energy and agriculture. Alexis, come on up. Thank you. The U.S. will need more than 10 million acres to satisfy growing demands for solar power. 90% of those acres will be in agrarian communities. The same land use conflict between energy and agriculture persists across the globe. The great challenge before us is to achieve our renewable energy goals without compromising food security. I've been engaging solar developers, farmers, and regulators to consider a solution, agrivoltaics. Agrivoltaics combine agriculture and solar into a single land use system. So imagine solar panels spaced out and raised up with crops or grazing animals integrated within. This, is, this disruptive innovation is nascent but exploding. In two years, agrivoltaics has gone from pilot test studies to an industry poised to exceed 10 gigawatts by 2030. But even as an internationally recognized expert in agrivoltaics with an unparalleled R&D portfolio, I'm struggling to make this a reality. Why? Uncertainty. Uncertainty in agronomic and economic performance. Developers have been calling me for years saying, what kind of crops are going to grow underneath my solar panels? And what does that mean for my bottom line? Without this certainty, agrivoltaics remains inaccessible. So to solve these problems and answer these questions, I partnered with a horticulturalist, a solar developer, and a software engineer. And together we created Spade. Spade is a software tool that analyzes or you can build an agrivoltaic system and that will assess the growing environment underneath and inform what crops are suitable in that environment. Spade quantifies energy output photosynthetic radiation and costs, which makes agrivoltaics implementable at scale. We conducted a rigorous customer discovery process. I've um, managed to learn that there are multiple solar developing tools out in the world, but not a single one on the market can un assess the growing environment underneath the panels. I interviewed more than 40 stakeholders in multiple countries and gathered letters of support from solar developers in Europe, the Middle East, and a letter from the U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab. We address the total, we estimate the total addressable market to be 10 billion U.S. dollars. We even did user testing to make sure that the tool can meet the exact needs of the users. So what we need right now is to take Spade beyond an in-house consulting tool. Consider this. 
in less than three months, three people with one beta software have managed to deploy 60 megawatts of agrivoltaics in the US. That's 300 acres of farmland saved from conversion. That's 60 megawatts of power that can now be translated into carbon credits. That's a rural economic opportunity and job creation all at one time. So to take Spade beyond an in-house consulting tool to a fully realized software as a service, we need funding and mentorship. Upon funding, we will hire a software engineer to drive UI UX development. We will market Spade through a, a freemiums and free trials. We will license the software through a, so a subscription model. And ultimately, we'll build more projects in less time because there is no time to waste. If we're going to achieve our solar energy goals without compromising food security, we need to harmonize critical land uses. We need to build alliances across sectors. And ultimately, agri-take solutions allow that to happen. Thank you. Maybe would love to ask you. Maybe would love to ask you a question around the competitive landscape. What are you seeing out there that's close to disruptions that you're that you outlined for us? Absolutely. So, um, competitive to Spade, the software tool. In full honesty, this market is so niche, and I have yet to see someone in the competitive landscape. And I've been um, in agrivoltaics since its infancy. I started my graduate research in this back in 2018, and haven't left the industry since. I, there are solar modeling tools, as I mentioned, Aurora, PV Syst, um, Helioscope, but those were designed for solar systems. We've never yet thought, what can we do with the land underneath? That hasn't been assessed yet, and that's why we're stepping up, and we have that early uh, innovator competitive advantage. I'm curious how you will measure success. Uh, what, what is your most important boardroom KPI? Interesting. Yeah, I would measure success in um, megawatts or potentially gigawatts of agrivoltaics deployed over time. Or how many projects have we been able to, mega, in terms of megawatts, how have we been able to scale agrivoltaics beyond these niche little innovations at the community solar level? We want to see this at scale. And without knowing how crops perform, or without that forecasting tool or cost-benefit analysis that the tool allows, developers are really uh, skeptical and re hesitant to invest. So I would measure success in megawatts deployed on the ground. Uh, what type of uh, crops and uh, which markets are you targeting? Excellent. Thank you. I really wanted to talk about this, but three minutes isn't enough. So specifically in arid environments where water is scarce and the sun is burning crops. We've seen in test trials down in southern Arizona, crops are growing by 300% and they're demanding half the amount of water underneath solar panels. This is a climate resilient strategy. So we're targeting um, crops, chillets and peppers are growing three times as big underneath solar panels. So the market where I see the greatest opportunity at this time for crop-based agrivoltaics will be in arid regions where water is scarce and shade is an asset. Uh, Follow-up question, what, what type of challenges uh, deploying that solution, I'm guessing like you need to service the solar panels. Uh, w when you service the solar panels, is there a risk that it's going to interfere with uh, the crops in some shape or form? Or when you want to actually uh, get the crops when it's uh, season time, how do you deal with those, the logistics? Absolutely, and that's part of the consulting and design work that I do in partner with the help of Spade is thinking about these pre-construction considerations. So we space the panels to accommodate farmer needs, and we have that farmer identified before we build. So what equipment is he already using? How does he harvest? That informs the design of the system. So these panels are spaced wide enough for my tractor to go through or my friends to come through and hand harvest. The panels can not technology, tracking technology, they don't have to be fixed. Most are tracking the sun, so that means they can be um, lifted vertically or horizontally to protect from weather events like hail. Um, so we can think about the design beforehand and that we use uh, stakeholder information for farmers to do that. Maintenance, of course, we can do crop rotations so that some fields lay fallow or there's a cover crop, um, and that wouldn't matter if you want to go in there. So um, thank you for asking that. It, it exemplifies. Okay. Thank you, Alexis. Wonderful. I know. I know.
Thank you, Alexis, so much. It's fairly exciting innovation that she is uh, pitching here today. Thanks, Alexis. Entrepreneur number two is Audrey S. Darko. Audrey, a proud farmer and researcher, set up and leads Sabone Saki, a climate tech company at the nexus of regenerative agriculture, restoring soil health and degraded ecosystems, and carbon finance. Sabone Saki enables farmers to ease the transition towards climate resilient farming and food systems while earning additional income through a unique carbon financing tool. Please come up. I'm honored to be here, not just leading Saban Sake, um, but representing rural farming communities across Ghana and Africa. Um, today, I'd like to share our mandate and the learnings over the past four years, undertaking research and few pilots, and more importantly, sustainable decentralized biochar production um, across Ghana and across um, the continent. Our focus as, um, as a company pioneering carbon removal technology across Ghana and ensuring that we can build regenerative farming communities that are able to increase food production, store carbon in the ground, and at the same time diversify their incomes. I'll ask a quick question. What would you do if 65% of your source of finance or income was stripped away? entirely of it, and the remainder 35% at the brink of decline and depletion. Perhaps you feel less vulnerable and you feel you have a better bounce back, but that's not the case for Yawar, one of our pharma networks previously, who has to deal with 65% of her landscape being degraded and also at the mercy of drought, water stress, and soil biodiversity loss. So for us, we are enabling people like Yawa have a more, have a more innovative approach in restoring the degraded landscapes by storing carbon in the ground um, through Sabansaki circular model. I'd like to start off first by sharing what we do and how we are addressing the problem of drought, water stress, and soil biodiversity loss. 80% of the food crops are lost due to drought. The crop period has shortened on average to 20%. 49,000 plus jobs are lost due to this. And as well, Ghana is currently predicted to be water stressed in the, in the next three years. For us, it's really important to jump in now at the time and ensure that we harness the power of biomass waste, working with biomass generating com communities. We set up our carbon removal um, production center, which has our locally designed and fabricated closed loop um, pyrolysis reactors that help convert the biomass waste that will openly be dumped and then convert that into organic soil amendments that help restore their soils, help increase um, the water capacity by 64%, ensure that yields are improved by 30%, and as well are affordable by 20% cheaper by what's currently on the market. This is a $200 million and a $2 billion carbon market globally. For us, we are a team of scientists, engineers, and as well researchers, and I'm, I myself, I'm a farmer as well, so I'm on the front line of things and get to understand what it means to solve this problem. Our product is 100% organic. Two, it sequesters carbon. Every kilogram approximately sequesters 2.5 kilograms of CO2 in the process. It also has a standard NPK blend that helps them to replenish the nutrients and as well helps retain water by 64% and releases 50% better water for the plants. This is really important for us and we want to live up to the meaning of our name of transforming not just biomass waste into value added products that restore degraded landscapes but also transforming the mindsets of the farmers that we work with about the climate, the environment, and empowering them to do this at the front lines. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, question on the business model. Uh, those farmers usually don't have any money to spend and they're not interested in investing for the future because like you said, they, they work on the day-to-day -day life. How much does it cost? Did you get any validation that farmers are willing to buy this? We've been doing this for four years. 
um, we had two years prior research and piloting stage. What we did was first target one community. We've set up our production house within um, a sugarcane plantation community that allows us to harness the power of the waste, um, mobilized by women farmers who bring the waste to us. We pay them for it. We convert the process, create the products, and discount it for them at 50% because they're within the community. And then this is 20% cheaper per the, um, the, the national uh, price of organic products. And then because of this, because they see the process and we have demonstration farms, they are able to see the effect of it and also put their money to it. Because currently, Ghana, um, Ghana imports nearly 100% of their soil amendments, and this is really expensive. So ours is a cheaper option. What do you see as the biggest challenges to bring your product to scale? The biggest challenge has been with making sure we have automated machinery. We locally design and fabricate our, our reactors, which are by biomass waste itself. And be able to, to do this, it, this costs about $3,000 to actually make one. To be able to scale this across other communities would make it easier. Yeah. How much carbon removal can you scale up to by 2030? Okay, so we've done 30 hectares of, restor of restoring degraded landscapes already. We produce about 3,000 um, soil products already out of this. And by 2030, with 2.5, we're, we're hoping to, um, we're hoping to um, get 3,000 farmers on board and having on average three products for each of them. That's about 9,000. Um, so 9,000, about 9,000 tons of CSU sequestered, yeah. Can I ask what the strategy is for reaching the farmers? If you are to reach those 2030 targets, how is it that you're communicating, marketing, and reaching those farmers you need to and changing minds? That's a brilliant question. We discovered over the two years of R&D, primary R&D was that situating ourselves within the community, first of all, was the strategy to making sure that the farmers had a sense of belonging and understanding of what it takes to go regen. We also have had a demonstration farm just right next to our production house. And then we invite the farmers in, have our workshops, and they get to see how from the scratch to the um, production of food, they're able to use the product also um, learn about what it means to transition from conventional to regen and how better it is for their crops to reduce water stress and drought. So that's been our approach and it makes distribution very easy because they become our ambassadors because we're living within the communities. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Audrey, so much for that amazing presentation and the work you're doing. Um, a third, we have Adital Ila. Adital is a serial entrepreneur, sustainability expert, and industrial designer with the mission of re-engineering the way construction materials are manufactured, introducing fully regenerative building products. Adital has 18 years of experience in sustainability, design, creative management, and impact-driven entrepreneurship. Adital is a recognized leader in sustainable design and serves on expert panels and forums on sustainable development design and biofabrication worldwide. Come on up. Hello, Hello everybody. Thank you for having us. I'm Adital Ella, founder and CEO of Createra. I've been, I've been dedicating my career to sustainability design since the days of COP number three. 1997. I was born into the world of construction as a second generation to a family of builders and as a researcher in the field of industrial design I was inspired to find how can we how can we rethink the world of building materials to impact it from a sustainable point of view. It has become my life journey to find a way to produce constructive products while taking out of the equation the destructive process of firing minerals in very high temperatures. Eliminating firing from producing building materials would result in saving five gigatons a year. To tackle this reality, I built around me a team of scientists in the areas of material science, uh, structural engineering, analytics, and we are working towards this goal. After seven years of R&D, 
we are proud to introduce our market-ready patented technology to produce building products without firing it all. We never go beyond the boiling, point, uh, the boiling point of water in our products, and we are now establishing our first production line in Portugal to produce fully sustainable, fully circular, low-carbon tiles. This is our first application that enters a market which, with 103 billion opportunity, and this allows us to grow our company as, and generate revenues as we expand. We have a proven platform of producing precast products from tiles through cladding and masonry blocks. They all have the strengths of concrete, are six times more thermal, and yet are produced while saving 80% of the CO2 emissions and 90% of the energy. We are on a mission to creating a fully insulative wall, applying our thermal cladding and highly thermal masonry blocks to create buildings that save the cost of and energy of cooling and heating them. Eliminating firing from the area of precast products is a 300 billion opportunity and also could save up to 40% of the impact of the building market, which is to date 14 uh, gigatons yearly. We are fully committed to this journey and we see ourselves growing, collaborating with leading uh, players in the market in the areas of mar manufacturing and marketing through licensing agreements. We are here to make it happen, and we would like to invite financial and market partners to join us in making a reality of non-fired, fully circular building materials. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is the biggest challenge you're facing today in trying to get uh, the partners to license your technology and replace their current practices? Well, we, are, we already have a first licensing agreement to produce the tiles in an industrial scale, and we are looking through t towards additional, um, additional collaborations through to the masonry blocks and the claddings, which are in R&D uh, to date. So the tiles are fully proved and the industrial um, line is fully proved. Um, but of course, as we generate revenues, the market will be uh, a lot more um, open to accept that these um, products are really viable for uh, buildings um, through, um, through the years. You talked about a team of uh, material scientists. Can you elaborate a little bit more on uh, the uniqueness of the technology and the strength of that team? Yes, indeed. So um, our, uh, our team comes from, uh, we have a, a P, um, Tzvi Cohen, which is a, a doctor in the area of material science, specializing in building materials and the areas of uh, advanced uh, ceramics. We have uh, Dr. Leon Hum comes from the area of uh, structural engineering and um, analytics and advanced um, IA to create unique shapes that allow a thermal and structural um, um, product. Um, our team involves also mechanical engineers, people from the areas of analytics, and of course, um, the whole area of, uh, of uh, developing uh, production uh, solutions that allow us to hold today a pilot production site in Israel producing 300 square meters a year or a, a w month already and having over 100 uh, installations in Israel and in Europe uh, to date. Aside from the licensing, have you had any feedback from the market, from major purchasers in particular of these kind of materials? Yes, indeed. So our first market uh, outside of Israel is uh, the UK and the Netherlands. In the UK, we are collaborating with uh, Parkside, which is part of Top Styles, which is one of the four largest tile um, um, distributors in the, in the UK. So they are promoting our products in the last uh, year. We already have uh, first installations, and we met with uh, hundreds of architects towards uh, introducing uh, the products. Of course, once we have the full-scale production, it will be a lot easier to uh, enter the market, and we are aiming to to enter it at the level 
up uh, $25 uh, X works, which is the mid market. So no green premium and no um, no barriers uh, there. In addition, we have uh, uh, conversations with uh, San Goben, with um, TGN in the Netherlands, with many leading players in order to validate um, the products. And of course, they all went through um, lab ver verification, the third parties, EPDs, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and finally, last but not least, our number, our fourth entrepreneur, we have Kamal El Sweedy, co-founder and CEO of Rabbit Mobility. Uh, Rabbit Mobility won first place at the National Initiative of Smart Green Projects, an Egyptian initiative that has unleashed the potential of creative ideas that utilize smart and green technology to tackle climate change in ways we have never seen before. Please come to the stage. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you all. Uh, so, some sad but true facts. Cairo is one of the most polluted cities in the world. We have an average traffic speed of 10 kilometers per hour, 15 kilometers per hour, which is 10 miles per hour, because of the high number of cars on the streets. And that's the problem we're trying to solve. We built Rabbit mainly as a, an on-demand mobility platform for clean, short-distance transportation. We started with e-scooters, and then we added e-bikes to cater for even longer distances, and we're, we're currently working on adding e-Vespas to our fleet as well. So I think that now it's better. Uh, and we currently, to give you some perspective, 50% uh, of rides done in Egypt are for distances less than three kilometers, basically two miles, per hour, two mi two miles in terms of distance. And this, when it's, done, when it's done by a rabbit vehicle, an e-scooter or an e-bike, it typically saves 80% of the carbon emissions, 30% in the cost of travel, and 30% in the time consumed in travel. So it's always a win-win, and that's how we think of sustainability. It needs to be a win in terms of economically and a win in terms of the environment as well. We have two revenue streams. First is B2C, which is a paper minute or a paper day for end users. And we also pioneered a B2B model where we work with delivery operators on, uh, using, uh, on using our vehicles for long-term basis, three, six, or nine months, replacing gas motorcycles and cars. Um, in terms of numbers, we've been in the market for almost two years now. Since Jan 2022, we've been growing at 33% month over month in terms of rides, in terms of revenues, and we're currently operating in seven different cities in Egypt in almost 20 neighborhoods with 200,000 riders, 200,000 users who've done more than 500,000 rides. And that's basically saved us almost 50,000 kilograms of carbon emissions because these rides were replacing car rides. And that's what we're looking for. Our key metric would be the number of rides replacing car rides. Uh, in terms of the team, we're four co-founders. We have experience in strategy and management consulting as well as uh, designing and manufacturing light electric vehicles and competing in Singapore and Malaysia with our light electric vehicles. And finally, image recognition and machine learning, which helped us to limit the theft rate to around 2% of the fleet when compared to global benchmarks at 6%. Uh, I think that's it from my side. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, so the vehicles are being built in uh, Egypt locally? Currently it's built in China. However, we've been uh, building 50% of our spare parts locally and we're on track to have our first locally built vehicle by Q2 2022, 2023, sorry. What do you see as the biggest need to scale? Your biggest needs to scale? And the biggest so challenges? we definitely need funding. The demand is there. We started 2022 with 18,000 users. Today we're at 200,000 users, all organically with zero marketing spend. We worked on the education and the awareness of climate and how you're doing a ride with an e-vehicle saves carbon emissions. And we started seeing it even on social media, users posting how much they saved in terms of carbon emissions with their ride on daily, weekly, and monthly basis. And that's what we're looking for. The demand is there. We just need the funding to grow on more and expand to other cities in Egypt and North Africa. Uh, uh, great presentation. 
do your emissions reductions claims take into account the embodied carbon in the product? Yeah, it does. So we typically, what happens to our vehicles when they're salvaged, so our current vehicles have around 18 months of lifetime. Once we need to salvage this vehicle, we either refurbish it and sell it with almost half the price, or we extract all the spare parts we need out of this vehicle and recycle it. And as of October 2022, we've almost recycled three tons of material, and we're really happy and proud of this number. Can you give us a sense of competitors that you're concerned about, either existing um, uh, ride-hailing apps that might be out there that come in to do this kind of specific sustainability yeah. uh, venture, or other competitors in the market that you're seeing? Yeah, so currently there are no other micro-mobility operators in the market, or even in North Africa. However, as you mentioned, there are global players that typically try to enter the market when they see there's demand in the market. So we're expecting this to happen maybe by next year. And the other thing is ride-hailing apps. So there's, we have two, riding, two major ride-hailing apps here in Egypt, and they don't operate micro-mobility in any of their markets globally. So in terms of competition, we think it's safe right now. Maybe by next year when the numbers are even larger, the, demand start, the, the competitor starts entering the market. What is unique in Egypt compared to the other markets, and what is your unique advantage? So I think the solid, solid point, pain point, the pain point here in Egypt is very, very solid. 15 kilometers per hour as average traffic speed is a nightmare. If you're a good jogger, you could actually f run faster. <laughs> if you're riding a bike or a scooter, you're definitely going faster than the cars. And also what's good about the model here in Egypt, and it make, makes it economically uh, positive that the costs of electricity and of the on-ground team that runs the operations is much lower than the US and Europe. And that's why we're getting the same revenue per vehicle per day as global benchmarks in US and Europe, but we have almost 40% less cost. And that's why our margins are positive. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamal. That was amazing. And thank you to all four of our entrepreneurs. Great pitches and to our judges, amazing questions. Thank you all for your very thoughtful questions to these incredible entrepreneurs. So with that, we're going to take a few moments um, and excuse our judges to go back into the green room. Uh, we'll better have a moment to deliberate, and I don't know how. They're going to pick a winner from these amazing entrepreneurs. So thank you, judges. You are excused. And uh, to go do your hard work. Um, and it, they'll just take about, believe it or not, five minutes. So please stick around. You want to see who, who the winner will be. And in the meantime, I have the very distinct honor of inviting to the stage my colleague and friend, Monica Medina, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, International, Environmental, and Scientific Affairs. Assistant Secretary Medina also was recently appointed by President Biden as his Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources, the first ever it to hold this newly created and important position for the United States of America. So thank you, Monica, and please come up and tell us about your priorities for your bureau, what you're working on for 2023, and what you hope will come out of COP27, um, and how our, con our climate entrepreneurs all over the world can get involved with your priorities. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, what a great crowd. This is so much fun. I um, got to be here the other morning when we opened the U.S. Center, and it's been a hub of activity ever since. So thank you all for being here. How about another round of applause for our entrepreneurs? You guys are amazing. You are what makes us, I think, you know, inspired to do the work that we do every day. So it's my job to, I don't know, sing and dance, but I don't do either particularly well. So I'll just uh, pitch you on what we do at OES and in the State Department to help these entrepreneurs and to help everyone engaged in the climate crisis and the struggle to um, keep 1.5 alive. So can you all hear me? I think the mic is okay. Yes, good. So I'm Monica Medina, and our uh, Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science works everywhere from outer space to the depths of the ocean floor and beneath it. We protect every part of the planet, all the poles, every country, all the ocean space, everything. So we're busy, it's a big job, and we are working hard every day to ensure that entrepreneurs like these wonderful ones and so many others and advocates 
corporations, anyone who wants to be involved in solving the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the plastic crisis, uh, the ocean conservation crisis, we could go on and on. There's so much work for us to do. And of course, there are no simple solutions. But hopefully, with this kind of entrepreneurial spirit and with the creativity and the energy and the drive and the enthusiasm and the stick to itness of entrepreneurs like these, we can solve the challenges in front of us. Um, it's incredible. I don't know how our judges are going to pick a winner or a, I don't know, pick the best one among the four. Um, but let me at least tell you the criteria that they are going to use. The first criteria is potential for impact. What impact would this innovation make and can this innovation be scaled? Second criteria is novelty and competitive positioning. Did each entrepreneur demonstrate a strong understanding of the competitive advantage they may have compared to other competitors? Can they win in the competitive market space that they may be in? Third criteria. Confidence in technology. Are the technological claims credible, backed up by modeling or research or validation or some other sort of justification? And finally, confidence in the team and the company. Is the team well-rounded, experienced? Have they demonstrated an impressive track record compared to the stage, the relative stage of their, of their uh, entity? So we did this once before, I'm pleased to say. We had a similar pitch competition. We called it a shark tank at the UN Ocean Conference, um, which was quite fun. And we had a similar group of really fantastic entrepreneurs. And um, it was uh, quite inspiring for everyone who was there. And we look forward to partnering with companies like these and others to bring this kind of com competition, pitch competition, and opportunity for entrepreneurs to every future summit like this one. In fact, we have several summits coming up in the years ahead. There'll be another COP next year. We have a biodiversity COP coming up in a month. Um, we are starting a huge line of negotiations on a plastic agreement. Global plastic pollution is a huge problem. We're drowning in it, and we're depending on entrepreneurs like these and so many others to help us find the solutions that we don't yet have. We don't even know how we're going to tackle the plastic pollution challenge. So we are hopeful that we can continue this kind of pitch competition to bring entrepreneurs, to bring young people into the conversation about how to solve the climate crisis. We know we stand at a crossroads. What we do today in the months and days, the days and months ahead could be the turning point, will be the change that we need to actually get to that 1.5 degrees or as close as possible to that. We need scientists, we need innovation, we need leadership, and we need all of your energy and enthusiasm to help us. We need you to come back to this pavilion over and over again, hear what the U.S. government is doing. The State Department is here, but so are countless other U.S. agencies. We're bringing the Transportation Department. We had the Treasury Department here. We've got the Energy Department coming. There are dozens and dozens of administration officials who are here. We'll be in and out of this U.S. Center the entire two weeks of COP, and we will be thrilled to have a chance to interact with all of you and to make this a most meaningful U.S. pavilion. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled again to be here today. I'm pleased to be able to partner with Dorothy. I think we have so much that we can do together in the Commerce Department. I mean, in the Commerce, in the State Department. You can tell I used to work at the Commerce Department with Teresa Christopher, one of our judges. So it's a small world. Um, there's so much that we can do at the State Department to reach out and partner with people across the world. And if I had to tell you um, anything, it is that the Biden administration is all in on this fight on climate, on biodiversity, on water security, on nature, on saving the planet. The president is committed to protecting 30 percent of the planet by 2030. That's a huge task. We are also committed to doing that at home. 
And we have now the tools that we need. We have the wind at our back. We have the infrastructure bill, obviously, and now we have the Inflation Reduction Act. These are game changers. These are the kinds of legislative authorities and funding that we need to help more innovators like these, and we will. We will. We will be helping innovators. We will be using the power of government to leverage every good idea, to leverage all the technology that we need, all the innovation, and every possible um, assistance we can get from communities, from state governments. We, when we kicked off this center, we had Mike Bloomberg here to talk about how cities are all in. We know state governments are all in. We know that climate is something that we have to confront now. So uh, I am thrilled to be here to be a part of this particular pitch competition. I, like I said, I hope we do more. Please tell your friends and other entrepreneurs in your networks. We will continue this program with the help of wonderful sponsors. We will keep having these kind of pitch competitions just to show that the U.S. government isn't just about rules and regulations, but it's about lifting up entrepreneurs. It's about creating jobs. It's about turning the climate crisis into the biggest job opportunity that this world has ever seen. We, are the big, we have the biggest program to solve the climate crisis, and we have the biggest opportunity to transform our economy. And I know that if President Biden were here today, and he will be here tomorrow, I know that what he will talk about is how climate change is a challenge, but it is also a huge opportunity. It is a way for us to build our economy, to be the best we can be in the 21st century, to lead the 21st century. And everywhere I go all around the world, this is what we have to offer other countries as well. It's our innovation. It's our partnership. It's multilateralism. It's bringing people together to solve the world's big problems. And everywhere I go, I see more and more desire to do just that. So anyway, I don't know if the judges are uh, pretty close. Hopefully they are. Um, but I, I can't thank Dorothy and the organizers of this competition enough for the great work they did to find these entrepreneurs and look forward to doing this over and over and over again. Absolutely. Hey, uh, Monica, can we take a quick picture? Can we get a picture with our logo? Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Assistant Secretary. Thank you so much for the work you're doing, you and your team and your bureau, and the way you represent the United States here at COP27. We are so grateful to her and her work. Uh, so let's see. Are we getting a nod from the green room? Or I, we might have to tap on the door. Um, looks like I think we're about ready. <laughs> Am I supposed to extend and do a little, as uh, our assistant secretary said, I can't sing and dance either, so I'm not sure how, well, but we well, will fill the time. Well, let me explain what we have going on here at the U.S. Yes. Center for the rest of the day. Yes. Well, I can oh, also elongate the time, build Great. the suspension of what's going to happen. <laughs> so we have open exhibit time here at 1130, which basically means you can take advantage of both an art exhibit, the First Movers Coalition, Yeah Network Peace Boat, as well as the Meta uh, Immersive Learning, do some VR. Um, at 1 o'clock, we have climate conversations over at the high top tables with the chief scientists of NASA and NOAA, as well as Dr. Anthony Lesowitz from the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication. Again, those will be at the high top tables. Just come on by at 1 o'clock, pull up a chair, and have a nice casual conversation on climate. And then at 1.30 is our next event here on the main stage, Preparing for Change, a whole-of-government approach to food and water security. And then, of course, if you want to get a schedule for the rest of the events, you can always take a photo of the QR code on the map. And I think I did my job of extending time. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Wonderful programming here at the U.S. Pavilion. So our judges are ready. I can see they're ready to come out and make their announcement. Please come to the stage. We are good to go. Excellent. Well, first, I'd like to say a big thank you to all those amazing entrepreneurs. Please give them again a round of applause. 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for working out those important topics. Uh, it was great to hear about the stories. So my colleagues are going to announce the winners. I won't have to, to make that uh, hard uh, announcement. But I would like to offer all of you on behalf of Google a place in our program for the Startups for Sustainable Development. And we'll be glad to support you along the journey, whether it's six months, a few years, as long as possible, with expert mentors, help with funding and technology. So I'm very honored to be helping you in your next journey. So you've definitely made it uh, incredibly tough for us. Uh, I want to announce that the winner is going to get $50,000. Uh, seconding that, great presentations by all of you. You're all going to be very successful in your careers, I can guarantee you. And we have collected $30,000 for the runner-up. So I want to thank you all as well, great presentations. Um, and I will announce the runner up is, and I apologize if I mis, uh, mispronounce your names, um, Adatel Ella for Criteria. Congratulations. And finally, thank you so much again to everybody for your amazing presentations, your amazing contributions, um, and all the great work you're doing. Sadly, we can only have uh, one winner, and that is Audrey Sidarko of Savansaki. Huge congratulations. part of this in, um, incredible the opportunity to highlight your work thank you so much thank you all for coming to the to this event it was super exciting as you can see again we have a busy set time here at the US Center for the rest of the day we have open exhibit time starting very soon, head, check out the, uh, the Peace Boat Art Exhibit as well as the First Movers Coalition, the Meta Immersive Learning. We have Climate Conversations coming out at 1 o'clock at the high top tables. And then our next event here on the main stage um, is 1.30, Preparing for Change, a whole of government approach to food security, the food and water security. Thank you all for coming so much for coming to the U.S. Center and come back for the, next, the rest of the COP as well. Thank you.
Hello? Hello? This way. Hello everyone. Our event is going to sort start shortly, so please take your seats. Please take your seats. Thank you for coming to the U.S. Center. I'd like to introduce our NASA Hyperwall Talk, an overview of NASA Earth Science, with NASA Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor, Dr. Kate Calvin. Thank you, Tom. So what I want to do today is give you a quick tour of NASA's Earth Science program. At NASA, one of our most important missions is our home planet. Um, starting with observations. So we have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station, that can show us what our Earth looks like today. And since we've been doing this for decades, we can also see how it's changed over time. One of the things that we see, um, you know, as we're looking over time, is we can look at things like sea level rise. And so we have several satellites. We've, for 20 years, we've been measuring the height of our seas. And we see those sea level rise. We can also look at what's driving changes on the Earth's surface. So one of the things that we can look at is carbon dioxide. And what we see here is that carbon dioxide concentrations have been rising over the last 100 plus years. So in 2013, we crossed 400 parts per million, a level we haven't seen in hundreds of thousands of years. Um, this animation is showing you carbon dioxide concentrations per latitude, and it's animating over time. And it's using both satellite observations as well as surface observations, like those collected by our sister agency, NOAA. Um, these increases in, in carbon dioxide are driven by human activity, and they are trapping heat within our planet. So when you think about the temperature of a planet, it depends on how much sunlight is coming in, and then how much of that is reflected back into space or trapped. Um, and greenhouse gases trap heat. We can measure the amount of heat that's trapped from space. And so this figure on the right is showing heat trapped in the Earth's um, atmosphere. Um, the animation on the right is going to show you surface temperatures starting in the late 1800s and animating way, its way through today. The surface temperatures are uh, they're from surface observations. But what we've seen is that 2021 was tied for the sixth warmest year on record. Collectively, the last eight years have been the warmest since modern record keeping began. When you look at these temperatures, we're seeing more warming over land than over ocean and more warming in higher latitudes than lower latitudes. And that has important effects on human systems on, and on other parts of the Earth system. So with the increased warming over the high latitudes, we see changes in ice. Um, we see warming of our oceans. Um, so this is a model simulation looking at ocean circulation and ocean heat content. The oceans absorb a large fraction of the heat in the atmosphere as well as the carbon. Um, it's absorbed by the surface ocean, and then ocean mixing will take it down to the depth of the ocean. And how much more heat and carbon we can absorb depends on those mixing properties. Um, we can see some of that from space, and we complement that with models to better understand the Earth's system and how it's changing. As temperatures are rising and seas are warming, what we also see is changes in the mass of ice sheets. So this is showing ice sheets over Greenland and Antarctica. Um, you'll see here the orange and red covers are where we have lost ice mass. Blue is where we have gained ice mass. And this is from a set of satellites called GRACE and GRACE Follow-On, a partnership with the German Space Agency. They measure changes in gravity at a very, very fine scale. And as a result, we can see changes in the mass of ice sheets or changes in groundwater storage. And what we see is that our ice sheets are losing mass. So they're, we're melting the edges of the ice sheets, and it's flowing into the ocean. As a result of this change, as well as other changes, we're seeing increases in sea level. So sea levels have risen. Um, the figure on the upper right is from satellite records measuring satellite altimetry. So it's telling you the total height of the sea, so the total sea level change. 
But then we can complement that with things like the satellites I showed you before and figure out what's driving those changes. So some of it is from more water in the ocean. As our ice sheets melt, there's more volume of water. Also, as seas get warmer, they take up more space, and so we see sea level rise there. And then there's also changes in land at, um, at very local scales. Land can rise or fall depending on other factors, and that affects local sea level. Um, so these affect our communities and infrastructure and our economy. So we're also seeing changes in precipitation, so more heavy precipitation events and more droughts as a result of climate change and increased warming. These also affect our ability to produce agriculture and drive other changes in extreme events like changes in, fire, uh, in crop yields. So we can look at crop yields both in the past as well as in the future using crop models. We are also seeing, as a result of warming planet, um, more fires. Um, and so we're showing you here active fires, which we can see from space. Um, and so we can see as, it, as the weather gets hot, dry, and windy, it's more prone to wildfires. And this is really important um, around the world. There's a lot of parts of the world that are experiencing more of these wildfires, and it's affecting infrastructures, it's affecting homes. Um, and we can see this. The animation on the right is from the Camp Fire in 2018. Um, and we're observing this from space. And one of the big things that we're doing at NASA is trying to take this information to people and make sure they can use it. So this is just a quick animation of a tool we have called FIRMS, the Fire Information Resource Management System, and it'll let you look at active fires in near real time so you can see where their fires are burning, where you live. In addition to showing near real time imagery, we're also communicating about future projections. So we use models to look at how much warming might happen in the future and what the impacts of that are. So we have another tool related to sea level rise where we work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to take the sea level rise projections from their report that they released a year ago and show you where you live. And so we can look at different coastal cities. You can see how much sea level has risen up until now where you live and also how much it right, might rise in the future, depending on how much more warming you experience, which is driven by how much more emissions that we have. So just to conclude here, my quick tour of Earth science. So we're continually observing the planet, using models and resources to take that information and give it to people, and we're working to make it more accessible. And as we go forward in time, we'll be launching more satellites and doing more Earth observations. So just a little over an hour ago, we actually launched a satellite for our sister agency, NOAA, that's going to help us look at weather and extreme events, and we're really excited about that. Um, so that happened. Um, yeah, a little over an hour ago, and coming up in December, we actually have another mission called the Surface Water and Ocean Topography that's going to tell us more about fresh water and oceans. And I'm actually going to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Tahani Amer. She is originally from Egypt and now works for NASA, and she's going to tell you all more about the, the upcoming mission. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tahani Ahmed, and I'm, uh, I'm honored and, uh, to be here with you. I want to talk to you about SWAT, which is a game changer for all of us. It has to do with all the surface water and the oceans. And we'll be launching December 12th. And this is international collaborations with, uh, with CANAS, with the French, with the UK, and the Canadian. And what SWAT is going to do for us is going to show us the detailed measurements of the rivers, uh, the reservoir, any river that has, including the Nile rivers, any river that's 100 meters wide and any reservoir, and of course the oceans. And what you see here, you have the antenna of the deployable antenna, which is called the Karen model. And the Karen does, it has a K, uh, KA band radar inferometer that measures all this. And you look at here in Florida and we'll be able to see all this uh, detailed information. And what this does, it prepares us to know what's going to happen in the future and prepare the coastal regions to make sure that we are all safe. And all the scientists, we have 26 countries that are working with us and waiting for this data. We're going to have one terabyte data a day for this, from this mission. So we're all excited about it and I want you to, uh, to watch for SWAT and we'll be there in 1212. Thank you. Now, uh, this is a Q&A session, and if you ask a question, you get a NASA swag. <laughs> so, uh, anybody you have a questions about SWAT or Air System? Right here? 
Don't go over there. <laughs> oh, yes, please. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do fresh water, the oceans, everything. Yes, yes, we will. Yes, good questions. She get a swag. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Please. We, okay, thank you. Do you know of any partnerships with the European Union or the Netherlands Space Agency in this regard? We, always, we work with ESA all the time. We have a lot of uh, mission with ESA and actually have a project that's going to be coming up. We're working with ESA, yes. We, we partnership with them, yes. Any other question? Yes, me. Hi. So I've lost my voice, but I'll try to be loud. Are you going to have ways of providing information for people who work in places like planning, site planning, people who are informing the rapidly urbanizing urban cities? Will the information for SWOT help us to try to identify where to avoid new construction? Well, actually, that's a good question. Yes, sometimes when you, you understand, when we when collect this data and know what area that's very, uh, could potentially affected by water and water surge, that will be kind of information that will help for the effect of the climate and how it's related to water and people. Exactly. That's the connection. And you can check our website, and it has all the application of SWAT. So we build the hardware, we bring the observation, and then there is a lot of application to that. And what you're talking about related to application, and it's exactly our point. Thank you for your questions. Yes? Uh, he, his first, then. Whatever. Hi, I was wondering where the data would be available publicly. Of course. NASA has a policy that all our data is, are free and, and be available. But we have certain uh, activity we have to do in the beginning. We have to calibrate our satellites, right, and instruments, and then we launch the finalized data. Yes. Questions in the back? Last question. W one more. One more in the back. Yeah. Very, very brief one. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm from a United Nations Global Compact. That's part of UN, which is dealing with private sector. Could you elaborate a bit more how NASA is uh, cooperating with private sector? Oh yeah. So I am. So NASA does a lot of work with private sector. Like m most of this hardware that we build for and satellites, they are not built in NASA labs. They are built with with our partners, industry, academia, right? Not only just industry, academia, industry, nonprofit. So we partner with everybody to meet our needs and their needs. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you can ha uh, excuse me. You can have NASA swag from here. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, S no S W O T dot uh, dot gov. Yes. Yes. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the U.S. Center. Our next event starts in 10 minutes, preparing for change, a whole-of-government approach to food and water security. Again, that starts in 10 minutes at 1.30 here at the U.S. Center. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you to our speakers as well.
Testing. Hey, yep. Hello, please take your seats as this event is about to begin.
Hello and welcome to Preparing for Change, a whole of government approach to food and water security. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage the Chief Climate Officer of USAID, Gillian Caldwell. All right, the rest of the panel should be coming on out. But in the interest of time, I won't be introducing all of them right away. They'll come and have a seat, and we'll start off uh, with our keynote speaker in just a minute. So my name is Gillian Caldwell. I'm USAID's Chief Climate Officer, and I'm really pleased to be uh, moderating today's panel, which is focused on PREPARE, uh, President Biden's emergency uh, initiative for uh, resilience and adaptation. This was announced at the last COP, and uh, we really want to talk about the progress we're making in a whole-of-government response to tackle the very serious challenges that countries are facing worldwide on adaptation. So the panel's called Preparing for Change, a whole-of-government response to food and water security. And uh, to kick us off, I'm really thrilled to welcome our keynote speaker. Um, he is the United States, United States Special Envoy for Global Food Security. It's Dr. Kerry Fowler. And Special Envoy Fowler is perhaps best known as the father of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. You may or may not have heard of this, but it provides sort of the ultimate security for more than one million unique crop varieties worldwide. He was formerly the executive director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, a professor at Norwegian University. Um, it would really take me too long to articulate all of his accolades, but he's um, just a tremendous, uh, a tremendous asset and a tremendous leader, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. So Dr. Fowler. Thank you. How's the, how's the sound level out there? Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank the moderator and everyone who's been involved with putting this panel together. This is an important time for us to be considering these issues. I think everyone here understands that we're in the midst of a global food crisis, and most of us will understand that there are three major causes. In English, we say it's the three C's, climate change, COVID, and conflict. But added to those causes are a host of other causes. We have water issues around the world. 21 of 36 major aquifers in the world are being depleted. Um, we have high fuel prices, which in turn has led to high fertilizer prices. We have low grain stockpiles. In a sense, we've had a perfect storm. And if you look at all of those different causes, this sets us apart from many of the former food crises that we've had, simply because we have multiple major drivers of this food crisis. And one thing that means, of course, for us is that we have to address this issue on multiple fronts and won't completely solve this food crisis until we do. And that, unfortunately, the reality is that um, 2023 is going to be a difficult year. This food crisis is not going to be over by the end of this calendar year. It's going, to, it's going to persist. Um, we have 828 million people who are food insecure in the world today. And that number is, is sort of incomprehensible to all of us as human beings, but it has a human face. We have 60 million children who are suffering from wasting and 150 million children who are uh, suffering from stunting. But of all those major causes that I outlined behind our current food security crisis, I think the one that we really have to pay attention to and the one that's going to drive future problems in this field is climate change. We've had 453 consecutive months in which the global average temperature exceeded, for, for that month, exceeded the 20th century average for that month. 453 consecutive months of, let's put it this way, quote unquote, unusually high temperatures. What this means is that climate change is not something that's coming in 2050. 
climate change is here now. The climate has changed, and it's still changing. You can see this all over the world. You can see it in a historic drought in the Horn of Africa. Uh, you can see it in the floods in Pakistan. You can see it in droughts and heat waves around the world, including in the United States in the West. These are not anomalies. This is business as usual going forward. And that's why PREPARE, the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, is, is critical. In September of this year, the White House released uh, a PREPARE Action Plan, and it has three pillars that I want to outline very briefly. The first is that our government will work across departments and with external partners to strengthen early warning systems uh, and climate information so that everyone around the world, from governments to non-government um, institutions, can have access to the base, uh, to, the, to the best information. And so that even down at the farm level, farmers can begin to prepare for what is here and is coming. In other words, to prepare for less predictability. Second, we want to work with our partners to integrate these types of programs into their national and local uh, programs and policies and budgets. And finally, we need to catalyze public and private capital and resources to support climate adaptation actions. In my field, in the food security field, we actually have made a, a, a fair amount of progress in developing climate smart agriculture. We know much more about what that really means than we, than we knew a decade or, or 20 years ago. This is a pillar of the government's own food security um, uh, policies and plans. Let me give you a couple of examples. One is the Feed the Future program. This is the um, flagship of our U.S. Agency for International Development work in the area of food security. We had until recently 12, program, uh, 12 countries that were targets for the Feed the Future program. We just expanded that to 20. Um, the eight expansion countries being all, all in Africa. We have co-founded, very proudly uh, co-founded, the Agric Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate, which we call Aim for Climate. Google that, Aim for Climate. Uh, we co-founded that with the United Arab Emirates. This is to uh, highlight what I guess you could call moonshots in the field of, of climate, climate adaptation. Uh, far-reaching projects and initiatives, and uh, by highlighting them, what we hope to do is to garner resources and attention for those particular uh, issues. Recently, uh, my office, in cooperation with USAID, has been working on a large program uh, in southern Africa uh, where we will hope to work with partners there in this case, Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, but also in Central and Eastern Africa to increase food production in a very sustainable way, to, uh, to improve fertilizer uh, efficiency uh, efforts, and to integrate these into a, a development package that, that will really work. Um, finally, I just want to mention that one thing that we want to hopefully uh, be a catalyst for at the State Department is something that I, I find most basic and which many of us in the international community are not paying sufficient attention to. And that is the problem of adapting our crops to climate change. You will see many different projections that we need to uh, produce 50 or 60 percent more food by 2050, and you'll see uh, similar projections about how much food we will produce. But many of those projections don't take into account climate change, or pest and disease outbreaks, uh, or conflict, or inflation. What we seem to be doing, talking globally here, what we seem to be doing is assuming that our agricultural crops, which are domesticated crops whose evolution and adaptation is in our hands, are magically going to adapt to climates that perhaps in many areas of the world we haven't seen in the history of agriculture. This is an unlikely occurrence. What we need to be doing is focusing attention on the crops that are vitally important for food security, 
Um, and we will begin to do that with partners looking in the first instance in Africa to identify the, the crops that are most important for food security and to assess how they will perform in the emerging climates. And on the basis of that, we will have a, a rational foundation for making uh, economic investment decisions in the future. So um, I just want to outline in closing three principles that I think should um, guide our work in the PREPARE program that the President has laid out. The first is that we have to look at the entire food system, not just piece by piece, and we have to bring all of government and even people and institutions outside of government to work together uh, on these issues. The second is agricultural research has a vital role to play. The amount of money uh, devoted to agricultural research has been declining as a percentage of budgets. Uh, obviously, in a climate-changing world, we're going to need much, much more uh, focused agricultural research. The third is that nutrition has to be at the center of what we do. It's not enough, and frankly, it's counterproductive simply to be thinking about designing agricultural systems on the basis of providing lots of calories. Nutrition is a lot more than calories. We need to pay attention to that. And finally, we know that we can't do this alone, that uh, our success is going to depend on strong and diverse partnerships. Um, that's inside government and it's outside of government and it's outside of, uh, the, of the United States. So um, these are the pillars that I think will guide the work under the PREPARE program that the United States is, is initiating. Um, we look forward to partnering with, with all of you we look forward to making progress in trying to build a, a sustainable system uh, that can really adapt and thrive in the, in the uh, era of climate change. Thank you very much. The, the thing that really struck me about what Dr. Fowler had to say is that there's nothing about this that is business as usual. And that's exactly what we recognize uh, within the U.S. government. And I, I think what you're going to be hearing um, uh, with, from our U.S. government colleagues, although we have a colleague from Niger as well, is all of the ways in which we are adapting to the current crisis to try to be more responsive. And the other thing that struck me was your point that uh, we can't do it alone. The U.S. has really been leading in terms of contributions to tackle the global food security crisis by a substantial margin. And we just invite other countries to join us in the Secretary General's call to action, given the scope and scale of the crisis we're confronting. Uh, next up, I would love to introduce Alice Albright. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, affectionately known as MCC. She's got over 30 years of international experience in private, nonprofit, and public sectors. And um, she's really the strategic vision and the guiding light for MCC. So we're honored to have you today, Alice. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you so much. Uh, well, it's wonderful to be here with everybody today, and uh, in particular with our friends from Niger, who are very close partners uh, of MCC. MCC is really um, honored to be part of the, the overall PREPARE endeavor. In fact, we are, um, with, with a number of other people, uh, very involved in a big piece of it. We're co-chairing uh, the infrastructure work there, and uh, it's wonderful to see this administration taking such an all-in, whole-of-government approach to the overall topic of adaptation and building resilience. Uh, this is not a topic that is new to MCC. Uh, we have been uh, involved in the whole uh, topic of adaptation and resilience for many, many years. We launched a new climate strategy last year, uh, and uh, we take a very particular approach. As you may know, MCC is a grant-making organization. Uh, we work with, uh, we have, we were created in 2004. We've deployed $15 billion, uh, and to, to many, many countries throughout the world, 49 countries. Uh, thus far uh, in our uh, climate work, uh, we've taken a very, very integrated approach and we help countries identify all of the different pieces that, are, that they face in their journey to becoming uh, resilient and contending with the challenges uh, of climate. 
we've deployed a lot of money. Uh, thus far, we've between 2015 and 2020, we've deployed $1.5 billion in various activities related to climate. We've got another billion on the way and more after that. What is distinctive about our approach is that we work hand in hand with countries to deliver large packages of financing to help them build infrastructure, meet critical development needs, and support their choices to help them finance their NDCs. And you'll hear more about that uh, from our friends from Niger. Overall, our work takes on three different sort of focuses or priorities. The first one is adaptation. Let me give you an example of that. Um, recently, we've just concluded a $350 million compact with Mongolia to help them maintain a sustainable and affordable water supply. Uh, we've built an advanced water purification plant that will draw water from various sources to help that country strengthen its access to water. Uh, our next focus is equity. We all know that much about climate change affects people and the extent to which different people are impacted by, by climate change in different ways. It often impacts more marginalized societies, women, people who live in rural areas. So we're very focused on that. Um, and so we're committed in our work to looking at how equity cuts through the climate challenge. An example of that is what we're doing in Kosovo. In addition to having uh, deployed $200 million to help that country uh, with energy efficiency, with additional battery storage capability. We're also working on incorporating how women get involved in the work in that country. Finally, let me talk about finance. And we announced uh, a terrific new initiative yesterday. If we all look at the amount of money that is being deployed towards various climate solutions, it is not nearly enough relative to the price tag for the problem as a whole. It, the price tag exceeds all of the amount of money that is available from governments worldwide. So we need to come together and figure out how to deploy the money that we have, but use it to bring in and leverage additional sources. So we announced yesterday a new uh, program with our friends at USAID called Climate Finance Plus. We changed the name from yesterday because we wanted something that was a bit more uh, easy to roll off the tongue. It is now called Climate Finance Plus. It will work with all of our partner countries to bring together private finance complemented with government resources to begin to develop the sources of finance we need to address the challenges ahead. So altogether, MCC is very committed to playing its role in PREPARE and helping all of our friends throughout the U.S. government make a difference in this key area. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, we'll only be hearing from three agencies today. The Prepare Action Plan, which was developed in the months following the announcement at COP, includes 60 concrete actions that will be taken by a total of 19 federal agencies across the U.S. government. So it's, it's quite comprehensive, but it relates back to the core pillars that were described. Um, this or early warning for all, mainstreaming adaptation into all policies and programs, that technical guidance for governments, and catalyzing finance, which is um, what Alice was just speaking about. So next up, our um, allies from Niger, we will be hearing from Ali Betty. He is the High Commissioner for 3N, which is the food security program in Niger. So over to you, Ali. Thank you so much for inviting me to this important gathering of supporters of climate change mitigation. The supporters of climate change mitigation are also the friend of adaptation. Are you? I am the High Commissioner of the 3N Initiative. 3N means Nigerian, Nourish Nigerian. It's our food security and nutrition and sustainable agricultural development in Niger, our sectoral policy. President of Niger, Mohamed Bazoum, placed sustainability of our natural resources as a top priority of our country now and into the future. I am here on behalf of the Republic of Niger to introduce and promote our commitment to climate change, 
mitigation among our international partners. We are what we call a poor country, but we are a smart, a smart country. We are a good governed govern country doing our best to allocate public resources to create stability and opportunities for our population. We have national strategies and initiatives that, if we can realize our ambitions, will put our, our country and its population in a path to long-term economic growth and social stability. The key is harnessing our asset, sun, land, water. Niger has sunshine. We have plenty of sun power, which is untapped as a complementary source of energy for households, public services, and business. I state complementary, complementary because we have rich oil resources here and we have to find a smart integration and balance of promoting renewable and tapping non-renewable energy sources. The President Mohamed Bazouma administration has a plan to invest in solar technology to generate energy for household and business. We invite our partners interested in promoting solar energy solution to come to Niger and invest alongside us to bring power to the people to generate income and improve, improve livelihood. Our goal is to bring solar power, powered electricity to 100,000 households for the next three years. And sorry for every year, business and uh, for household and business every year. Please join us in this challenge. We thank MCC Millennium Challenge Corporation and the MCA Niger for uh, investment for their investment in solar power to jump start small scale irrigation for the production of higher value crops for some targeted 4,000 families in southern Tawa region, Doso region, and Maradi. Niger has land. I say we have solar and we have land. Niger is twice the size of the state of Texas. Speaks, it speaks to Americans. They know Texas. Twice Texas. And much of it is desert and a growing desert. But that can be stopped and reversed using simple low cost and reclamation approach. The top two approach promoted by the administration is a very, a very big way of tree planting and what we call half moon, demi lune, and other techniques that are promoted by producers. President Bazoum is committed to greening Niger. We invite you to join us in this fight against desertification and land degradation and align with President Bazoum's Green Wall Initiative. We seek financial support to meet our goal of planning a, a, a minimum of 5 million trees and rehabilitating 2,000 200,000 hectares every year back to produce to productive grazing land land please join us in this challenge i would like to thank all those ngos who have aligned their programming to this initiative and to mcc and mca who have already reclaimed over 70,000 hectares there's investment secure a more prosperous future for generation to come. Niger has water also. That is right. As a result of MCC and MCA Niger's work 
with groundwater resource reform, recent commissioned remote sensing, and the hydrological modeling of the southern Doso region is shocking everyone in terms of richness of Niger's groundwater resource. The finding reveals astounding result. It shows never before high resolution of four layers of aquifers at 10 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters, and a deeper depth hold, holding some 660 billion cubic meters of water, rechargeable water. The question is no longer the, the question no longer is, does Niger have water? Yes, we have water. In fact, it's the richest groundwater resource in the Sahel region. President Mohamed Bazoum has established a national growth water authority to promote the use of advanced technology, consultation and collaboration among government, civil society and the private sector to inform strategies for monitoring, optimizing use and sustainable management of this valuable resource for the betterment of all Nigerians now and well into the future. President Bazoum has a goal of creating access to water for irrigation across um, 266,000 hectares for his uh, period of uh, ruling Niger. Please join us in this challenge. I want to thank the U.S. government, especially the U.S. Embassy in Niamey, MCC, and the USID mission in Niger for their continued strong support for water resource seed management in Niger, and we welcome others to join in our quest to bring water to farmers, to herders, to households, villages, and business across the country to spur economic growth, secure stability, and improve livelihood condition, especially for our rural population. I end my remarks with extending an invitation to all to, all to come to Niger and feel the sunshine. We have the sun. Walk the land, touch the water, and see for yourself the enormous potential this natural resource asset, one harnessed with smart strategies, represent for the wonderful people of Niger. Thank you. Thank you very much. You heard several calls for co-investment, especially in water and solar. And um, you know, for many of the countries where we're working, it's difficult to attract the private sector because the countries don't have the credit ratings that the private sector expects. And that's where MCC and DFC and USAID can play a role in helping de-risk those investments. It's one of the things you'll be hearing about. But first, I wanted to invite Bill Hohenstein. Uh, from the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture. He's the director of um, uh, USDA's Office of Energy and Environmental Policy. So he's really the focal point in environmental and climate change issues. He told me he's been working in this area for two decades. He's also part of the climate negotiations team and a representative on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. So over to you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, again, Bill Hohenstein. I am the director of the Office of Energy and Environmental Policy at USDA, and within that is our climate change program. And so I cover all things climate change for the Department of Agriculture. And it's a pleasure to be here today on the launch of the Prepare Action Plan. We are happy to join our colleagues in the State Department and USAID, and we really appreciate their leadership on Prepare. Um, we're also very excited that we're focusing on food security and agriculture first. We, we think it's quite important when we think about adapting to climate change. Um, and first, to clear up a misconception, farmers are adapting to climate change today. Um, we certainly are seeing that. 
Um, but what I like to say is that they're adapting reactively. We're seeing reactive adaptation. They're reacting to the extreme events, the changes in seasonality, and they're responding to what they're seeing in front of them. And what we're really hoping to do is to become more proactive, to adapt proactively, and, and to use the a Canadian example, to not skate where the puck is, but to skate where the puck is going to be, right? So that is the challenge, to anticipate climate change and to acknowledge that not only are we seeing climate change today, but it, the rate and the timing of climate change is actually accelerating. Um, it's also important to recognize the magnitude of the challenge. Uh, climate change affects every aspect of food security. So when we think about the four elements, availability, certainly climate change affects crop and animal production, but it also affects transportation, the ability to get food from one place to another. When you think about changes in barge traffic if there's a drought, things like that. It affects uh, accessibility. So if you can get the food to the store shelves, is it affordable? Can people afford it? Um, utilization, it's an underappreciated element of food security. So you think about not just having calories available, but are they the types of things that people are used to seeing? So if we see changes in, uh, in a growing area and a shift in where crops are grown, are people in communities expecting to see the, the things on their short shelves and are they what they're used to buying at a time when they're used to buying them? And then finally, stability. Um, do we have enough stability in our food system in aggregate? Um, and what we're seeing is not only are we seeing climate change happening, but it's not being well behaved. In fact, what we're seeing is uh, climate change not only affecting average temperatures, but it changing the probabilities of extreme events and making the entire food system more unstable. Um, uh, analysis has shown that already climate change has lowered uh, global agricultural productivity growth by 21%. Um, that's like losing seven years of productivity growth just since 1960. And in some regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, the rate of productivity growth has declined by over 40%. So what do we do? Well, at USDA, you'll hear us talk a lot about the need to enhance and increase sustainable productivity growth um, because we're going to need to feed not just today's people but at future populations. We can do this by being more extensive or we can do it by sustainably intensifying production on existing lands. So sustainable productivity growth doesn't solve all the problems but it keeps more options on the table and it helps solving these problems become a little easier. We also need to focus on resource health, soil health in particular. And what we found is that healthy soils make farmers more resilient to climate change. So they can better withstand drought, they can better withstand extreme weather, and they can maintain productions in these rough years. Um, we'll need to focus on improving efficient use of resources, water and fertilizer in particular. And we'll need to focus on climate information and getting information into the hands of farmers so they can plan. Um, in the U.S. we have a very sophisticated drought monitor. Um, we're developing drought early warning systems. That type of information is going to be needed globally for all farmers. And then finally, we need to acknowledge that we need to prepare farmers to be prepared for losses in greater extremes and to be resilient to them financially. So what's USDA doing about this? Well, we're part of the team. Uh, we bring a lot of technical expertise to the table. We have 100,000 employees across USDA. Um, we have two offices in particular, the Foreign Agricultural Service and the International Forestry Office within the Forest Service that help uh, compile and improve access to the work that we do across USDA. And we are doing a lot. We're integrating climate change into ver every aspect of our activities, whether it be research, or extension or technical assistance. Um, we're active partners in the Feed the Future program and also in a program that USDA runs called Food for Progress, where just in September we announced $178 million in seven projects in Jamaica, Malawi, Peru, and Thailand. And in Thailand, uh, we're standing up a regional knowledge hub on climate change. We're focused on capacity building. Uh, we 
uh, conduct fellowships and exchanges. We bring researchers and technical experts into the U.S. to work with our scientists and our analysts. And as uh, Car Carrie said, we're um, leading efforts on Aim for Climate, this new initiative um, that Secretary Vilsack will be talking about more in the next couple of days. And that effort is really critical because it will help bring in new innovation and new technologies to address climate change. Um, so finally, I wanted to make a plug. Secretary Vilsack is arriving this evening and he'll be here for the next two days. We've got a lot of exciting things to talk about and some new things we're going to be announcing. So if you have the opportunity to catch one of his talks, I would certainly encourage it. So thank you. I, I like that thought that climate change is not well behaved. <laughs> I think that's probably the understatement given what we're dealing with. And in fact, climate change and global warming are really not doing it for me anymore. I mean, I think we need to recognize it. it's a crisis and we better start acting like it. Um, so again, let's, let's get away from business as usual. Um, next up, last but certainly not least, is Scott Nathan. He's the Chief Executive Director of the International Development Finance Corporation, known as the DFC. And uh, Scott's going to be a, an interesting person to hear from because he comes from a long-standing background in the private sector. And a lot of what we're thinking about right now is how we attract the private sector and engage them because we know we're not doing enough and we can't do all that is necessary through the public sector to tackle the crisis. Um, so Scott's been in investment for over 20 years. He was in the State Department in the Obama administration. He also worked at OMB, which is our budget terrain. And um, it's really great to have you here, Scott. Over to you. Well, thanks so much, Gillian. It's great to be here, great to be part of this panel. I'm going to be brief because I know we want to get to a little bit of a discussion. Um, but as you've heard about, uh, PREPARE is an initiative across uh, the federal government, a whole of government approach, and it's terrific to be here with some of our partners in that endeavor. USEID is an extremely important partner for the Development Finance Corporation, really in everything we do. So it's great to be here with you. Alice, uh, as always, it's great to be on the stage with you. Uh, MCC and DFC are terrific partners, very complimentary. And although I don't normally cross paths with USDA, it's, it's great to see you, Bill, and be part of the panel uh, together. Um, so yesterday's theme here at COP was about climate finance. Everybody knows it was the topic of many, many discussions going on yesterday, and obviously it's woven through the whole program and part of uh, the discussion more broadly about the crisis, that we have a gap for climate finance. There's no way we're going to be able to tackle the problems posed by this crisis without tapping into private markets. Uh, my organization, the, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, exists to help mobilize capital in the developing world to address the most critical problems and really, as we all know, the climate crisis poses the most critical problem. Um, for us, uh, that often uh, means that on climate, we're working on mitigation measures, power in a clean, sustainable, renewable way, um, other efforts to help with uh, agriculture, to help with e-mobility, other mitigation efforts. It's adaptation that under the PREPARE initiative that we're trying to also focus on but for an organization like ours that needs bankable projects that are commercially viable, sustainable for private finance, uh, where we can help de-risk those situations and catalyze the finance, adaptation poses an additional challenge. Often those companies, those projects working on adaptation aren't uh, in the same way as mitigation uh, coming forward with commercially viable business plans or contracts that are bankable that we can finance. Nonetheless, uh, President Biden uh, last year at COP at Glasgow gave us the challenge to work on PREPARE. Uh, we, uh, as part of the whole of government approach you've heard about, have been working on that. And we can draw a line from uh, Glasgow to today for our organization and make an announcement. I'm really pleased. Um, as part of an announcement I made from this podium yesterday about the Development Finance Corporation's overall uh, climate finance activities in our last fiscal year, 
the year that ended September 30th. We did $2.3 billion of climate-linked investments that smashed any previous record uh, that we had previously done. But today, I'm also pleased to announce for the first time publicly that of that $2.3 billion, uh, three, $390 million was specifically for projects and companies focused on adaptation. That's, that's a huge number for us, uh, way beyond what we were hoping to do. And in addition, beyond that $390 million, uh, there's $200 million that we've committed to equity funds that are focused on finding adaptation solutions. So that number will grow. The 2022 number for adaptation will go beyond the 390 million, uh, hopefully well over 500 million once the funds that we've supported uh, start making underlying investments. And these investments, they cover a, a, a wide gamut. Um, in India, we helped a company by making an equity investment to focus on building grain silos, a big part of the type of food security issue we've heard about from my colleagues. Uh, is about preventing wastage, about reducing logistical complexity, about bringing the farmer's product more directly to market, and we're supporting those kind of businesses. Um, in Mozambique, we focus uh, on supporting a company that's expanding uh, drought-resistant aquaculture facilities. Obviously, uh, finding ways to make aquaculture more resilient, more adaptable to climate change is an incredibly important way to address the nutrition issues that you heard about uh, from my colleagues. Um, we committed $20 million to a fund called Responsibility that's supporting climate smart investments all over the developing world uh, for small businesses focused on building out the kind of food systems uh, that I'm mentioning. We're really interested in supporting small farmers, helping them get rid of layers of complexity, middlemen, uh, disaggregating and disintermediating uh, some of the issues uh, they face. Uh, and through our provision of finance, we're hoping to help address that problem. These are just some of the examples. Uh, there's, there's many more, but we're focused on small and medium enterprises, aquaculture, agriculture, logistics, infrastructure, health, water, more broadly. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to announce today that we're also putting out there what we call a soft call for applications for more in this area. Uh, the type of sectors that I just mentioned, all adaptation pro, uh, focused. And we're really hoping uh, that all of you and those uh, watching online will think about generating projects, submitting applications, and hopefully leading to more investments, more opportunities for us to finance solutions because uh, for an agency like mine, the only way we make a difference is through transactions, through the provision of financial support. There, there, there's no other way talking about it uh, isn't good enough. So to conclude, I'm thrilled to be part of this event. I appreciate Gillian, you uh, moderating and guiding us through it. Uh, it's an important issue, one that we can uh, intend to lean into hard to do even more. We're thrilled to be able to set a new high water mark uh, in this past fiscal year to really address this uh, challenge. And we intend uh, to keep raising our sights and doing all we can to address this critical crisis. Thanks so much for having me. I'll use the other one. So um, thanks so much. I think we've got time for uh, one question for each of the panelists, but looking, doing my math, um, it's like uh, two minutes or less by way of a response, if you wouldn't mind. So um, Alice, we're talking a lot about food security or food insecurity, um, and this is a crisis that is very complicated, and there's a huge value chain where food is involved. So can you just break it down a little bit? Give us a better sense of what you all are doing in the food security context. Thank you, Jillian. Let me talk about, about the numbers and the approach. In terms of the overall numbers, uh, we've invested more than $5 billion in partner countries to address the many different sources of food insecurity, uh, including $1.7 in agriculture and irrigation programs. And we've helped train hundreds of thousands of farmers and uh, provided uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of irrigated land for farmers. 
the main word is an integrated approach. So we look at all the different places of the value chain of what does it take to get food to market, whether or not it's at the farming end where there's insufficient uh, water, there's you know, maybe land titling issues, policy issues, all the way to transportation. A lot of what MCC does is building, help build road networks to get uh, goods from rural areas to main highways to market. Uh, and then we also spend a lot of time on what I'll call the institutional and policy issues that um, get in the way of farmers getting access to their land. We're working on this in Lesotho for the moment uh, so that they can make better use and scale the land that they have. So we work at sort of all different pieces of the process and it will remain, I think, a very important part of our work going forward. Uh, that was uh, excellent and action-packed and succinct, so thank you. Um, Ali. What you, you talked, I think, alluded to some of the challenges of financing your transition. Can you talk to us a little bit more? You've, you know, you've submitted an NDC, you've set your mitigation targets, you have aggressive goals on solarization. What challenges do you face in advancing your goals on the mitigation front? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, as you can imagine, imagine there is a lack of budget to implement the various activities related, related to Niger's climate change strategy, mainly due to the massive portion of the national budget required to fight terrorism that we face for some years and uh, ensure security of pop to ensure security of population. President Bazoum is doing his best to find a balance at a very difficult time. Second. I would say that the lack of coordination and lack of alignment around our national strategy among different ministries, donors, civil society who have financing for climate change mitigation increases risk of ineffective use of limited funding and the speed of impact. And third, to avoid the risk of failure, it's very important that initiatives and strategies introduced in Niger take into consideration that our population is poor, both income and asset. This combined with a very low literacy rate, especially among women, requires that climate change mitigation must be customized to the capacities of intended beneficiaries. If not, precious financial resources risk very low uptake, very low replication, and very low impact across the population. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. Uh, I, c I can relate to the challenge of coordinating across multiple agencies, so my, uh, my sympathies on that. Um, Bill. You talked a lot about innovation in agriculture, and you mentioned the Agriculture Innovation for Climate Initiative. What kind of challenges are you facing in stimulating innovation and attracting innovators to the space, and, and how, are you, how are you navigating those? Yeah. Hello, thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, we're gonna be hearing more about this over the next couple of days, so the aim for climate initiative is the agricultural innovation mission for climate, and it is attempting to address the problem that we're underinvesting in research and fundamental core uh, technology development within the agricultural sector. And so it's a challenge to governments, to the private sectors, to the NGO community, to expand and accelerate this research across the board. Um, and we've had a very uh, big start. You're gonna be hearing from uh, Secretary Vilsack and his counterparts in the UAE, where we stand after year one, um, and what we have ahead of us in terms of uh, 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 the next year. Um, the, the core is that we're not gonna be able to solve these really big challenges we have, the dual challenges of climate change and global food security with the technologies that we have on the shelf today that we're gonna need not only to continue to develop new technologies, but to accelerate the pace of those technologies. And so at its core, it's like a moonshot. It's a challenge to all of us. Thanks so much. Um, Scott, I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more, you alluded to this, um, but at 
really the agriculture value change and more specifically the work you're doing in the food and water space? Thanks for the question. Um, for sure, I'd love to talk about it because it's really the individual projects, companies, transactions we do that makes all the difference. So um, I alluded to some projects we're doing in aquaculture. In Indonesia, we're working with a company called Aruna, which through um, sort of tech-enabled solutions helps the, the aquaculture farmer directly connect uh, the harvest of their fish uh, and their seafood to the end user. The, getting the product to market more quickly with fewer uh, intermediaries is critical to prevent wastage. It brings more income to farmers. It makes a, a difference for the sustainability of uh, the industry broadly. Uh, we've supported a fund called Water Access Acceleration Fund, which is all about uh, making sure that there's sources of sustainable uh, and clean water for agriculture and for communities in uh, uh, communities that are the hardest hit by climate change. And I wanted to specifically highlight uh, one of our investments to a financial institution in your country, uh, Minister, in, in Niger. Uh, Aura Bank uh, is a company that we've supported with an on-lending facility specifically to provide financing to small farmers to help um, the, make sure that there is a capital flow to the smallholder farmer uh, to establish them in a more sustainable, uh, long-term fashion. So uh, it's the full range, the provision of financing to the private sector to have a sustainable way for these businesses to um, address uh, the issue, the crisis that we're talking about, uh, and hopefully add to the bottom line so that they can uh, pay back the financing, grow, and make a difference for their communities. Thanks so much. I think we're going we're gonna to wrap um, in the interest of time. I just wanted to make a few observations and concluding remarks. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about adaptation. That's a focus of today's panel and um, trying to convey the range of work the U.S. government is doing on this front. But one thing I think we all know is that we have a long way to go on adaptation and especially where private sector investment is concerned. Less than 2% of private sector investment goes to adaptation. The vast majority goes to mitigation. That might be a slight underestimate because there's so many investments you can make that have both adaptation and mitigation co-benefits. It's much easier to measure the mitigation co-benefits. But the, but the fact remains, it is hard to attract the private sector into this space. So the, what I like about a panel like this is that we're starting to concretize it. What are we talking about? What, what sorts of investments can you make? And what can we do to ease the path for private investment on that front? Um, as we mentioned at the outset, uh, President Biden has committed to uh, working with Congress to deliver $3 billion in adaptation. That's part and parcel of the $11 billion commitment he made at the UN General Assembly. Um, Obviously, we have a tripartite uh, government. We've got to do all we can to get uh, Congress on board. And um, you know, things are still unfolding on the congressional level, but um, look, look better than they might have. So that's fantastic. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, a lot of people talk about the expense, uh, the expense, uh, the, the cost of um, of the climate crisis, the three to five trillion we need on mitigation adaptation combined. The truth of the matter is, inaction is a whole lot more expensive. I mean, for every dollar that we invest in adaptation, we know it's documented fact that we can yield between two and ten dollars in return. So, rather than continuing to talk about the cost of uh, doing something, we should focus on what it would what it would mean if we didn't do something. If we continue on the path we've been on for too long, which is a path of insufficient action. And I can say, you know, having uh, playing my first role in federal government ever, that this is a government that is deeply committed to trying to get something done at that, that came across today. So uh, thank you all so much. And thank you to our allies in Niger. Have a great day. Bye-bye.
Hello and welcome to the U.S. Center. Our next event, Strong Medicine, U.S. Progress in Enhancing Health System Sustainability and Resilience at Home and Abroad will start in just a couple minutes. So please find your seat.
Hello, everyone. Our next event will start very, very shortly here at the U.S. Center, Strong Medicine, U.S. Progress in Enhancing Health System Sustainability and Resilience at Home and Abroad will start in just a minute here. Please take your seat. Hello and welcome to the U.S. Center. Very excited to have our next event here, Strong Medicine, U.S. Progress in Enhancing Health System Sustainability and Resilience at Home and Abroad. And introducing our first moderator, John Balvis, the Acting Director of the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Short bit of music. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today at what I hope is one of the most exciting events here at the U.S. Side Event Center, at the U.S. Center, Strong Medicine, U.S. Progress in Enhancing Health System Sustainability and Resilience at Home and Abroad. So we're, why are we talking about strong medicine? Health is often left out of the conversations in climate change. In the meantime, the health sector in the last couple of years, as you're going to hear, has been strengthening in its climate resolve and in its climate action and starting to take its place where it needs to be in the midst of this conversation we're having about strong climate action. We're going to have two halves to our event. The first half is going to be the at-home part, and we're going to talk about actions that the Department of Health and Human Services has been taking um, in a domestic context. The second half will be the abroad part, and we'll hear from USAID and the State Department about some of the international programming that's going on around the world. So a year ago in Glasgow, um, we were really pleased to show up and to commit on behalf of the United States to the COP26 health program. At that time, our delegation was headed by Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Rachel Levine. Admiral Levine intended to be here and to be speaking um, as our opening speaker. Unfortunately, at the very last minute, she was unable to make the trip, and I'll be standing in, in her place. But this was the very first time we had a government delegation from the Department of Health and Human Services led by a principal. And we were very excited to make commitments to the COP26 health program, which called for us to commit to decarbonization of the health system, to making health systems more resilient, in the face of that, of course, to be addressing the resilience of people and to be protecting the health of people, especially those most vulnerable. And as part of those commitments, we also committed to updating our vulnerability and adaptation assessments for health and to making a national adaptation plan for health. I'm here today, very pleased a year later, on behalf of the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, to give an update on the substantial progress that we've made on those commitments. Before I get to that, I just want to say a little bit about why the health sector is so important, because often the complex interactions between health and climate change are not fully appreciated. The first reason is the most obvious that climate change has many, many different health impacts, and those health impacts are occurring right now in the United States, around the world, with the most severe impacts on those who are already most overburdened by health disparities, by ill health, by poverty, by things like um, dep deprivation of social determinants of health, structural racism, et cetera. And so the first reason the health sector is so important is we have to be taking care of the people who are being affected, whether this is through unprecedented heat waves like we saw in the heat dome in the Northwest, whether this is through the rapidly strengthening hurricanes in the United States and the Gulf of Mexico, most recent knocked out 16 hospitals when it struck Florida and caused the evacuation of thousands of patients. The unprecedented wildfires that we see in the Western United States and Eastern Australia, the kinds of floods that we saw in Jackson, Mississippi, that compounded decades of neglect of the wastewater system there and led to contaminated floodwaters affecting a community that has been suffering environmental injustice for many decades. 
we need to strengthen our health systems to protect our people. That's number one. But number two is the good news story, right? Health brings a unique good news story to the COP because when we take climate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, especially if we are reducing the combustion of fossil fuels, we are cleaning the air and starting to save lives. Seven million people are estimated to die around the world every year by the World Health Organization. A little more than half of those are being exposed to indoor air pollution from biofuel combustion for cooking, but about three million or more are related to ambient air pollution from fossil fuel combustion. That's millions of lives, many, many hundreds of thousands to millions of, of illness cases that we could be preventing. When you look at the economic value that can be applied to the reduction in illness and to the reduction in deaths, that economic value exceeds the cost of attaining the targets. This was done for the Paris Agreement targets. That's a point that just cannot be said enough. It needs to be said by everybody in the climate sector, but at least the health sector has to be here to making that known. That's reason two. Third reason is that the health sector itself is a major contributor to the climate problem. It's estimated that roughly 5% of the globe's emissions of greenhouse gases can be attributed to health sector activities. In the United States, it's more than that percent. It's 8.5%. And so the health sector has a responsibility as a sector to strengthen itself and to strengthen its resolve in reducing its own contribution to the climate problem. So those are the three primary reasons why strong medicine is needed for the climate solution. I'm now very pleased to announce two very concrete ways in which the Department of Health and Human Services is contributing to this solution space. The first is that in April, we launched, in partnership with the White House, the Healthcare Sector Climate Pledge to enter into a partnership with the private sector, which is the biggest part of the health systems in the United States, to decarbonize the health sector and to increase the resilience of the health sector with a focus on health and human equity. We announced we had an event in June where we had an event with the White House for the initial signers of that, and we reopened that. We have expanded that. We now have more than 100. We have 102 organizations, not just hospitals, major group purchasing organizations, major pharmaceutical companies, major insurers have signed on to commit to these pledges of decarbonization and resilience of the health system. That's about one-sixth of the nation. In, a, in the first year of our commitment. We're very, very excited about this. But a commitment is a commitment, right? And I'm gonna talk about what we're doing to help those institutions deliver on that commitment. The second thing we're very pleased to announce, and I'm pleased to have um, Dr. Nick Watts, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for the National Health System in England with me today. We're announcing today that the United States and NHS England are entering into a process to align procurement requirements for our national health systems. For health systems around the world, there's a certain amount of emissions that are associated with the activities of the hospital or facility itself, what we call the scope one or two direct emissions, the emissions associated with the energy of the facility. But most of the emissions for any health system come from what's called scope three, the indirect emissions. Some of that has to do with food. A lot of it has to do with the supply chain and that's the procurement of medications, of IV fluids, transportation of these things. So we are going to partner. The NHS, as we will hear in a second, has laid out a roadmap for its procurement requirements for its national health system. And the United States is going to partner to try to align as much as we can our procurement requirements for our federal health systems so that we're providing a clear signal and an attainable uh, bar for the supply chain companies, which, as we know, are very largely global. That's what I'm pleased to announce today, but I'm going to just share with you some things that we've been able to do also in the last um, year since we made this commitment. We, I mentioned that all um, everybody committing to the COP26 health program commits to a, a cycle of vulnerability and adaptation assessments and a national adaptation plan for health. In Glasgow, we delivered the first version of our vulnerability and adaptation assessment, which was a regional assessment based on our fourth national climate assessment. 
Our office is undertaking, in partnership with other parts of HHS, a process now of going into communities, engaging communities and having conversations about how well their health needs are being met in the face of climate challenges in order to start to produce not just a vulnerability or an, uh, or, or a, you know, a, an impact assessment, but an adaptation gap analysis to guide the planning that we're going to do with our national adaptation plan. On the national adaptation plan front, we're very pleased to be bringing together all of the major divisions of health and human services to come up with division-specific adaptation and resilience and sustainability strategies. So that includes the Food and Drug Administration, Medicare, Medicaid, the big pieces of HHS are coming on board and we're hoping to deliver a specific climate change and health equity strategy by the time we are uh, arriving at COP28. So with that, it's my pleasure now to, to join my panelists. So I introduced Dr. Nick Watts, the Chief Sustainability Officer for NHS England, and I'm also joined by Beth Schenk, who's the Executive Director for Environmental Stewardship of Providence Health Systems. Providence Health, as we'll hear, was one of the initial signers to our commitment. They are leaders in the United States in the private sector in both the decarbonization and the resilience of their systems and the resilience of their patients. So very pleased to be able to have a conversation with them now. So Beth, let me start with you and um, tell us in the last couple of years, Providence has been out in front as a leader in this. What are some of the things that Providence has been doing that you're most proud of to share? Thank you so much, Dr. Balbus. And what a pleasure to be here with you all today. First, a little bit about Providence. <clears throat> as Dr. Balbus said, the US is different from the, from the UK here in that most of our health systems are private. Providence is a large, nonprofit, Catholic, mission-driven organization in seven western states, Alaska, Montana, Washington, Oregon, California, New Mexico, and Texas. We have 52 hospitals, almost 1,000 clinics, university, high school, multiple spin-off companies, and quite a broad reach, and quite then an environmental footprint. Um, we have set, as of a couple of years ago, an enormously ambitious carbon reduction goal and that is to be carbon negative by 2030. Now what that means to us is to do absolutely everything we can in this crucial decade. So we are pulling out as many stops as possible. I remind us all that this is on the tail of a pandemic and a financially challenging time for healthcare. Nonetheless, we're serious about this because we're demanded to do this by our mission. Our commitment is service to all, especially the poor and vulnerable. We know, all of you here know what that means for delivering healthcare services. But unfortunately, as John said, we're part of the problem. So we have two major divisions, our mitigation work and our resilience work. So I'm gonna briefly describe. For our mitigation work, we've created a framework called WE ACT. And that stands for waste, energy, water, agriculture, food, chemicals, and transportation. We believe that's the, the bulk, if not all, of where emissions are, even if they're through the supply chain or through our investments or wherever. So we have plans and actions in each of those categories, a widespread waste optimization plan in which we are sorting through our 30 waste streams to reduce and to um, uh, change the way we purchase to stop bringing in as much disposable. Um, energy and water, we're really working hard. We live in drought-ridden states. And we are working hard to uh, conserve water and move to electrical energy, uh, sorry, renewable electricity. In fact, 26 of our facilities are already on 100% renewable electricity through working with our utilities, through advocacy, and through our procurement of energy. For um, agriculture and food, we are working on decreasing the carbon intensity of meals served while also reducing waste from both food, pre-consumed and post-consumed, and packaging. For our chemicals, we're really focusing on those that are specific to healthcare in terms of greenhouse gases, including volatile anesthetic agents, nitrous oxide, and the propellants in inhalers. For transportation, we're working hard on our business travel and our employee commuting. This isn't a big piece. The employee commuting is a big piece. And we are really banking on the successful transition to electric vehicles. So now we're doing our planning for charging and for policies related to those because it's really hard to change everybody's behavior. So luckily, we're gonna change the way our cars are fueled. So that's an overview of mitigation. 
John mentioned the procurement or the supply chain piece. For us, in terms of our carbon accounting, our um, energy work is about 20%. Most of the scope three is about 80%. Of that, 40% of our total, or half of scope three, is in what we buy. This is enormously challenging because it's a global supply chain that is not very transparent. We don't know. We don't know what the materials are all often. We don't know what the scope one and two emissions are often. So this is gonna take a global effort. So I'm thrilled that you all are helping to come together. It's gonna to help us in the private sector tremendously. We're working currently with Healthcare Without Harm, with the National Academy of Medicine, with our GPOs, with suppliers, working hard to understand what are we buying? We don't always know. This is, this is very challenging, so thank you. I also just wanna thank HHS for the pledge we were one of the first signers. We're excited about it because it helps to amplify the work of the systems across the country in the US. It gives us clarity and guidance. Three, keep it simple, three things. Mitigate, reach half of emissions by 2030 and all by 2050. Have an executive leader, very important, to, to bring this into the culture of healthcare. And third, to have a resiliency plan. So I'm announcing today uh, one of our plans for our resiliency work, which we're starting, we've actually been doing for a long time because that's a big part of who we are as a health system. But we're in, I mentioned we act for our mitigation and we are using a, another mnemonic called we reach for our resiliency and that's resiliency, equity, adaptation, climate and health. And this is how we can get into our communities to understand the environmental determinants of health and to help to address them. Uh-oh. I'll just ignore that. Um, as we start to build resilience in the communities we serve, as well as in the buildings that we operate. Just one example, and then I'll hand the mic on to Nick. During the heat dome of 2021 that hit the Northwest US, it, those of you who are Americans know about this, in the city of Portland got to 116 degrees Fahrenheit, the city of Seattle to 108. Our buildings aren't made for that. Our hospitals aren't made for that. One of our large hospitals in Portland, south facing, large expanse, the windows and window frames and door jams actually worked. So you can say that this heat is actually melting our buildings. I mean, it's astonishing to think of the 40 million square feet that we manage. So we are up against that right now. So our resiliency planning is very important. So I will stop, I could talk for hours, and uh, I do want to thank HHS for this uh, leadership that really does help us in the private sector. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you for your leadership and the example that you're setting for the rest of the private sector. Um, let me turn now to Nick and ask you uh, to let us know some of the great progress that you have been making. We've referred to the roadmap that you're making for procurement sure. requirements. So if you want to say a little bit more about that, that's great too. It's a dangerous thing. John knows it's a dangerous thing to ask me to talk about things I'm excited about because I'm usually a pretty excited person. There's our timer. I can see the timer. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got three things. I want to talk a little bit about delivery. I want to talk a little bit about ambition. And I want to talk a little bit about fun. Delivery matters, right? The world's been sitting on its hands. And frankly, healthcare systems have been sitting on their hands for the last three decades when it comes to climate change. There have been some leaders scattered across the world, not many, not nearly enough. And quite frankly, I think unless we are talking about kilotons of carbon reduced yesterday, unless we are only measuring success by kilotons of carbon reduced, then we are in the wrong decade. So for the NHS, one of the things we're really excited about is that we are starting to get there. In fact, our target last year was to reduce our emissions by 1,281 kilotons. We were cautiously proud and optimistic to hit that. We're damn excited to have hit our second year target as well, 2,006 kilotons of carbon. It's a weird number, kilotons. No one quite knows what it means. You don't know if a megaton is big, if a kiloton is big. I'll put it in context. For the NHS, uh, 2,000 kilotons is roughly the same as heating, powering every single house in the city of Manchester. It's roughly the same as driving five billion miles 14,000 times to the moon and back if for some reason you wanted to do that and could do that. So I'm excited about the delivery side of it, that we are moving into that new phase. I'm excited about the ambition, and I want to make sure that everyone heard, properly heard, what John had to say just then. 
if scope three of our supply chain emissions are 60, 70 percent of this delivery of what we are tackling, it is critical that we are running at this and we are running at it with the full economic, with the full might of the United States, of the United Kingdom, of healthcare systems across the world. For the NHS, we have been clear. Within the decade, the NHS will no longer purchase from anyone that does not meet or exceed our commitments on net zero. And that is a vague sentence, so let me be even clearer. One minute past midnight, April 1st, 2027, we have new qualifying criteria that we put into every single tender. Now we have a roadmap that starts today and walks the whole way through to 2027. What is important is that ambition that John's talking about, is the commitment for us to work together over the next year to start to figure out how can we take this from just the NHS in England out to the entire world, out to the United States, yes, but quite frankly, everyone. Because when this becomes something that not just one country or two countries are tackling, when it grows into something that we are all tackling, it doesn't just become fun or positive, it becomes, frankly, inevitable. It becomes the future of healthcare. So delivery matters, ambition matters, and John, I think you've got a heck of a lot of that. And finally, fun matters. Go and take a serious look at British Parliament at the moment. Go and take a serious look at uh, the Australian rugby team who just beat the Scottish. Go and take a serious look at any sporting team, any political team. It is the team that is having fun that I put my money on to win. And it's really exciting, because I remember some of the very, very first times you and I met, there were only two or three of us hanging around working on this. One or two of them in the audience here. There are now so many people. We overwhelmed an entire bar last night with people angrily committed to fight on health and climate change. Those three things, John, that's what I'm excited about. I'm so glad you brought up the fun, because one thing I wanted to ask you, you know, we're talking about strong medicine, but we know that health systems, as we've said, are stretched to the max by COVID. And so it'd be very, very easy for people in health systems to say, how can you possibly ask us to decarbonize? What could you be thinking? We are already on financial ruin. We are already stressed. Our psychology is, you know, our, our mental well-being is stressed by the COVID pandemic, and that is absolutely true. We're broke. Aren't you going to be costing us money? If we were weakening medicine by this, it would be a really bad thing. But I think both of you have examples. How have your staff responded to these initiatives? Is this another strain or is this something that actually is something that's welcomed? And what can you say as a private sector organization? You are a Catholic organization and so the, the bottom line is just one of the elements, that, but you still have to stay in business. How has it affected the bottom line? Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, during the pandemic, when we announced our goal early on, I felt like, oh, people are going to be blinded by the pandemic. We're, we're going to just work in the background. But what I found was people were so pleased that we were doing this. They were relieved. They were personally relieved, their own anxiety and angst about climate. We live in progressive states. We live where people are, houses are on fire. It's a big deal. And so I think that is important. So the caregiver, we call our employees caregivers, engagement has been enormously important. But so is the bottom line. I mean, you know, people will say, we can't afford to do that. And I always say, you can't afford not to do this. You save money through efficiency and through resource conservation. I mean, it's as plain as if you just buy less at the store. It's really the same principle, use less. And you do that by being smarter about your resource use and also about how much of that you use, use or buy. So for instance, for our anesthesia work, we're up to close to $5 million in annual savings. From our travel work, about $5 million in annual savings. From our energy work, energy is a different t issue because of inflation. It goes up. So we're holding steady or decreasing a little bit while reducing our energy consumption significantly. We think that there are, I know that, um, well, we, we believe that across our health system there are 50 to $80 million sitting there waiting for us to clarify. And uh, we are, we believe that we'll be able to do that. Sure, so the NHS is big, right? Um, 1.4 million healthcare professionals, fifth largest organization in the entire world. And you're right, I had a little bit of a fear that, God, 2020 was busy, 2021 was busy, 2022 was busy. Do we really wanna put just one more thing on top of our staff? And I think I forgot two things, or maybe two, two bits of data that kicked us in the shin and said, no, Nick, that's not how people are thinking about it. Number one, 
Every three months, we go out and we ask, we poll our staff, hey, what do you guys care about? What do you want to see NHS do more of? In 2019, 87% of NHS staff wanted to work for an organization that was living up to their own values. Primum non nocere, right? They wanted to work for an organization that was tackling climate change. 2020, that went up to 89%. Weird. 2021, it went up to 92. It's now at 93%. We see, in fact, quite the opposite. Our staff gravitate towards this because this is a way that you get to take control of the future of your profession, the future of medicine. It's a damn exciting thing. The other data point, which is kind of my favorite thing of the year, we have a little micro-grant scheme. If you are a community nurse, if you are a occupational therapist, if you are, God forbid, even a surgeon, um, and you had a cool idea and you thought, does it really have to be this way? Couldn't we do things just slightly better, slightly better for my patients, slightly more efficiently? We had a very small amount of money, 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. The only criteria was you had to try something out, you had to shout about it, and you had to have some fun. We were worried because, frankly, the NHS is busy. We thought that success would look like 30, 40, 50 applications. Maybe that would be nice. We'd get 30 or 40 exciting examples. After three days of opening the call, we had 17,000 applications from 17,000 angry, excited healthcare professionals. We had to shut the thing early and we're going to have to reopen another round in quick succession because, frankly, we got overwhelmed. Thank you so much for those examples. We're running out of time. We've only had time to scratch the surface on what we have been doing. I ask everybody who has an interest to check out our website, www.hhs.gov slash OCCHE, Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, where you can learn about the other achievements of this past year. And with that, we'll close the first half and turn it over to our international colleagues. Thank you so much for being here today again. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Ployce, Deputy Division Chief for Maternal and Newborn Health at USAID. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your work in this area and some of the impressive announcement about the new partnership that will hopefully help lead the health sector in taking the next steps on this front. So we've heard highlights about some of the impress impressive action that's being done within one's country's borders along with partnership with others, especially regarding the healthcare system. But the U.S.'s international collaboration doesn't end there. And as our next panelist will show, within the health system, you'll hear how health facilities can not only employ renewable energy sources, but also become more resilient in the process. You'll also hear about broader public health efforts. This is what happens outside the healthcare system to reduce harmful exposures and risks and actively promote health and well-being. Often this is done by addressing the environmental and social determinants of health that John was referencing. And these are factors that are largely outside of an individual's control, but can negatively impact all health outcomes. And we know that it's the most poor and most marginalized that are disproportionately impacted by climate change, largely due to factors outside their control. And this shows clearly that climate change is a social justice issue. It is an environmental justice issue. The time when climate change was only a scientific issue discussed by climatologists and environmental, environmentalists is long gone, as you can see here. It's really a challenge that calls on all people, all sectors, all disciplines, to collaborate and partner together to have a substantial impact. And our panelists will share some examples of their work in this area. First, we'll hear from Secretary Monica Medina, the Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs at the U.S. State Department. And then we'll hear from Dr. Usman Daye, who is the Director of the Meteorological and in Senegal and the National Agency for Civil Agent Aviation and Meteorology. Sorry. And then finally, we will hear from Mark Carrado, the coordinator of the U.S. government's Power Africa program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes, sounds like it's all good. Thank you, Elizabeth, and hello, everyone. Um, it's 
you know, a moment here for us to sit and think, what have we been up against over the last few years? We had a growing climate crisis, and then we've had the COVID pandemic that has taken a toll on all of us. And I like to think about um, the pause that the pandemic caused in all of our lives and how it stopped and I think actually helped us to come to grips with both crises at the same time. Not only did it reconnect people with nature because they had a chance to go outside um, and experience it in their homes when they were stuck for so long, um, but then they also saw, I think we're able to look up and see and the crisis and the climate stresses that we see all around our country have been getting worse and worse and worse. And I, I would be remiss in not even noting that just today, earlier today in the U.S., I think there was a hurricane, a very uh, category one, weak, not really, but um, not as bad as it could have been, storm. Uh, this late in the hurricane season is pretty remarkable. So we know that the science is clear. And my current job um, is Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, Environment, and Science. So that means I work on climate change, but I also work on biodiversity and nature loss. I work on oceans and ocean health, and I work on health, health care, also sits within my bureau at this point in time. And we spend a lot of time trying to connect the dots between these crises. And actually, the best news of all is that if we work on them together, actually we can get a triple benefit. So if we think about conserving nature in places that also hold carbon and also are the places where zoonotic spillover is most likely to happen, we can actually get a triple bottom line, which is why I'm really pleased to be able to talk about what the Biden administration is doing to step up both at home, but also here in countries like Egypt and all around the world, and how we are working hard to continue to keep health care and our planet's health in uh, sync so that we are always focused on the fact that these two things are related. And I can tell you how much I stress this with the team that works with me and OES all the time. We have a health bureau over here. We have a nature bureau over here. We have a climate bureau over here, and all within my part of the State Department, and I'm always telling them we need to think about these things as interrelated, as interlinked. So uh, you've already heard uh, uh, from some of those who've been working hard to green the healthcare system in the U.S. That's an important thing. They're a big uh, sector of the economy, and helping them help us get greenhouse gas emissions from that sector under control is a big undertaking, and one I'm really proud that the U.S. government at the HHS and in the federal acquisition world is taking care of, it's working to get um, improved. But I'd also like to say that we have many other places where we are working to make people's health and their environment better, and USAID is one of the prime partners where they also pull together these threads of climate and health and see the on the ground impacts in almost everything that they do, particularly here in Africa, but in many other parts of the world. And I'm pleased to say that I was lucky enough to actually visit USAID health clinics in the Democratic Republic of Congo earlier this year, where I saw the work they're doing on the front lines with these zoonotic diseases that spill over from animals and how um, state of the art the technology is that they're bringing to these communities that otherwise would be uh, really fighting these diseases with very little um, in the way of tools to combat them. And I'm also very pleased that the U.S. government thinks about this even beyond our just our two agencies. We have a program called PREPARE, um, and it's our action plan for how we respond to climate change all over the world. And our goal is to help 500 billion people prepare for climate change, prepare and adapt uh, by the end of this decade. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge whole of government effort. It's not even just USAID and the State Department. We've got colleagues from many other agencies here. Um, and we try to do lots of different things, lots of different initiatives. And we are 
always looking for ways to make those multinational as well, to pull in as many partners as we can. So I'm very happy to announce that we are supporting a new international transdisciplinary collaborative research action on climate, environment, and health via the Belmont Forum, which is slated to launch earlier, early in the new year. And this effort dovetails with some other work that we're doing that's really important that I've been talking a lot about here at the center and all over this venue, which is about early warning systems and climate-based early warning systems are one key way that we can protect people's, not only their lives, not only their livelihoods, but also their health. There are ways in which we can predict where certain climate-driven diseases or um, health problems will be most evident. And I've been proud to lead a team in OES who are building out early warning systems for things like dengue fever and other disease-carrying mosquito illnesses in the Pacific Island states and in Central America, and early warning systems for heat health in Africa and Latin America. It's really hard to overstate the need for these early warning systems. It's something that we kind of take for granted in the US. Oh, it's gonna be a red day. We need to be careful about being in the sun in the middle of the day. Or we know there's gonna be a big storm like the one we've just had with a huge storm surge. So we need to board up our houses or we need to make sure that we've got our flood protection in place. But in many, many, many parts of the world, they don't even have the most basic forecasts that they can rely on. And without that information, people can't act. And that's the most important thing that we can do right away to help people adapt and be prepared for climate change. Um, there's just no overstating the, the need for this, particularly when our health systems are um, very stretched all around the world as it is. And um, we know we need stronger health systems to help uh, people all over the world deal with these crises. Um, and we also know that the same way that we have a health ecosystem, we also have natural ecosystems that help communities fight off diseases like the ones that they are facing now. And so I really hope that if there's anything I can leave with all of you today, it's that we really are in an interconnected system and that our own human health is dependent on the planet's health and the planet health, planet's health is dependent on us. So I just want to thank our colleagues in the meteorological world and in the public health and uh, public health delivery space for thinking about this problem as one that's um, interconnected and for trying to look for holistic solutions. And we're really thrilled to be able to make those connections and hopefully build those bridges into communities all over the world so that we, the U.S., can be using the know-how that we have to learn and we can, the best part about it is that we can learn and bring that learning back home to America as well. So thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I think, you know, if there's anything we have to do now, it's match our ambition with action and these things that we know how to do are one way that we can take action and again, bring back the benefits of what we learn in sharing what we know um, what we bring back and learn can be put to our own benefit as well. So thanks very much, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Medina. And you mentioned um, the great breadth of work that your department does, and that's very appreciated and has impacts across um, many of the sectors we work in and the partners. But, and you mentioned that it's not just the State Department and USAID that is engaging in this type of work. And we'll hear next an example of another um, the Office, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and some of their work um, in partnership with colleagues in other countries. And you also mentioned the importance of climate information services. So again, we'll now turn to our next speaker to hear an example of that in action. Thank you very much.
So we have a schematic on uh, how we make our early learning system. So it's a huge factor of engagement because we know that everybody has a factor uh, role to play. So at the beginning, we want to follow the rules of the sector. So together, everybody has different data, different ways to play this, you know, different loads of work. So we put together everything how we are going to do it. And make a trial, what we call case study in the field, because that if we see climate information, what are the and so, and how people will react to that. And to learn from it, because it goes in a larger scale. And uh, of course, capacity is very important to the community. So it's been a lot of training, and we are being very grateful for now for helping to do that. And uh, we did training in this way, we did uh, training on climate as well as training also on the health, so just on how the health system works. And now, we was thinking, or actually, we was building a very modern system. Very and put it in a map, I will show it later on. And then we work with the health department to look at what will be the impact of this heat, if the heat happens in week one, week two, week three, what are really the impact in some specific disease on health. So that's, that's the starting point. So we have the climate forecast, we tell us this is the signal, and what is the impact on heat. But it's not enough, we want to be impact-based forecast. What does it mean? It means we look at also what is the impact of the forecast in the environment. That's where we put a lot of stakeholders working together. We have disaster reduction department, environment, Red Cross for the dissemination, climate service and the health department. We sit on the table and analyze what is really the impact based on the past climate, based on the stage of certain disease emerging, so and so forth. And then we produce this map impact, uh, impact, um, map impact and then we disseminate it through different channels. The channels that we use, let's see if it works. Oh, here we go. So this is an example of a, a bulletin of a early warning system. As you see the map, if a Senegal map, you can see it on your left side. And there you put really where is the heat stress on. And then from there, if you look at the bottom, you will see that there are some color code saying that how severe it is and how it will impact some disease, like malaria, pregnant women, you know, those people having problem of, of health, so and so forth. And you put it in a in the bulletin here, and then we disseminate it in different stakeholders and also the government. And also we have also another way of disseminating the climate information, so it reaches everybody. And one way to do it, okay, let me try. okay, this is a schematic of how do we disseminate it. We use a lot of channels. We use, you know, uh, end user organizations. That means people are already organized and they have their own platform, so we plug in, in the platform and give them the information either through text messaging, either through community video, just information, through the voice messaging. I will come into that. It's very important because our first monitoring and evaluation shows that some people are just illiterate. Even though you send them a text message, they don't know what this text is about. So now we have a voice message in local, in local language. When you send it, record it, you send it, and they will get it. Although we show it also over TV and also over uh, networking, you know, different network platforms and we send it over email. So we think that this is very important because temperature is a very clear signal. We're going to go you know, up and up during the next years, and we really need that. And now it's working in Senegal, and we we'll try to upscale it. The other thing I want to rapidly go through is really we want to have an initiative really on climate and health in Africa. As I said uh, earlier, Africa will suffer most due to the lack of infrastructure lack of resources, and so on and so forth. 
So we put together an event during the AGU where we invite many Africans, everybody who works on those climate-related diseases to come, and also international and national, because there are some experts based outside Africa. So we can get together and to see that what is really the actual state of the research in climate and health, and try really to put something together. And uh, if we are working, oh, sorry, yeah. This is my last slide, actually. So the objective of this uh, really conference will be uh, to take advantage of what exists already in climate forecasting, it's very advanced, and try to see that how do we support human health by you know, early warning system and other stuff. So here are the objective of the meeting, and I wish everybody who is attending the AGU, you are more than welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is an excellent example. We talk about climate information services, and we know that the data that we've gathered and that we can gather Earth observations and remote sensing, it's vast. But the trick is really to translate that into information, into action, and connecting that to health systems so that then that can, the messages can be sent out to people, to those most at risk, so they can take actions that can really save themselves from those exposures. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at the AGU conference in Washington in May. Um, so next, we'll, I'll turn it over to Mark to share a bit of news and updates about Power Africa. Thanks, Liz. No, pleasure to be here, honor to be back at the U.S. Pavilion, and, and thanks for having your interest in what I think is a truly uh, important conversation, and, and one that uh, my colleagues have both noted is as cross-sectoral as they get. So I, I lead Power Africa, um, you know, probably one of the largest and I hope most productive cross-government, cross-donor, cross-private sector platforms in the history of public-private partnerships. And, and, and through that, we bring and have brought about 160 million people first-time electricity, which in and of itself, I think, is, is pretty fantastic. But at COP, and I think just about everywhere, we're always selling something, right? <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that powering health is one of the most important things we could possibly do. I was just sitting here kind of thinking to myself, what doesn't run on energy here? What in anybody's life doesn't absolutely depend on the fundamental billion block of energy? It's not only energy for energy access like we need, for turning lights on and reading, and that's often, you know, the posters we get with the solar lantern, that's where it starts. It's everything. The air conditioning, the lights, the communication, my notes on my iPad, my ability to communicate with my team, and it's the exact same in healthcare. And so when, when, when COVID hit, I think we all knew a lot of these lessons, but it kind of hit us like a, like a ton of bricks, right? I'm like, wow, we haven't done enough empowering healthcare. And I'm not sure, you know, not to be a, a little bit provocative, I'm not sure my health colleagues have done enough in thinking about energy. In fact, I'd be a bit provocative even to say, I bet you, and I hope I'm wrong, I bet you the health sector might spend more on diesel than we spend on energy programs in the U.S. government. I bet you it's at least very, very, very close, right? So the decarbonization play our colleagues said before is absolutely critical. We have to figure out a way because we need to have everything be a triple win. It's not enough for me just to bring power to people and say, did my job. It's not enough for my colleague to say, I've, I've, I've got a health clinic going by whatever means necessary. I got maternal child health, I got HIV AIDS, I got, I got PEPFAR, uh, in our case, or PMI, malarial indicators, I've done my job. It's not enough for any of us to do that anymore because time is too tight. Resources are never enough, even with the trillions of dollars that get spoken about at COP. We have to fight for attention to show how we need to work cross-sectorally. And for me, HFE is absolutely what does that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not the main part of Power Africa, but I got to tell you, it's probably the subcomponent I'm most excited about. So how did this start? Immediately when COVID hit, like everyone else, we went home to test our systems at AID and then come back. And so I said, team, complete stop, refocus. And we did a uh, across the board saying, we, we have a lot of goals we need to do, but we're going to take 10% of our, of our current fiscal year, and we're going to put it aside, and we're going to figure out what to do related to COVID. Because guess what? This is a challenge, if not one of the challenges of our generation. And then it hit the other challenge of our generation, which is climate. We said, we gotta figure out where, how, we, how we power health clinics. So we sat down and we thought about it. We immediately did some pilot programs, about $8 million or so through a current um, contract, and did about 224 clinics. In and of itself, great. Mostly though to learn about piloting different models and how we can do a couple things. Two things I think we've all noticed, unfortunately, over time is that you can go to a lot of spots in Africa and find a rusted solar panel on top of a health clinic. And number two, you realize that 
a lot of ways, people don't really ever think about that first building block. As I said before, it's kind of like however we get there, we get there. Let's get some power to that clinic. And that gives us unsustainable, unreliable, and often under-electrified. So a couple stats everyone probably knows, but I really want to really drive home the point. 100,000 clinics in sub-Saharan Africa don't have power. 100,000. We heard the lady from Providence talk earlier. I'm from Oregon. That's one of our health systems. Can you imagine going somewhere and just not having power, let alone the right equipment, let alone the right capacity, let alone, you know, I can't go to the clinic at night. I might not, I might not be able to get this life-saving uh, treatment I need, right? A lot of the, you work hard, you scrape, you get the right equipment in there, it shorts out because all the voltage is wrong. All these things compound, compound, compound. So this has, of course, a, a ton of... Um, a ton of, of repercussions. The saddest one for me is uh, WHO research has found in 2019, 326,000 children aged five or under died because of lack of access to power. Now, as a Power Africa coordinator, I go out there and I try to make the case. And I always get a little bit nervous I'm being too parochial and maybe a little bit too adamant. One of my colleagues, Raj Punjabi, who now works in, in the White House, used to be the, the, the malaria coordinator at AID, he said, I'll make the case for you. People die without power. It's that simple. So. What greater charge do we need? We can get a climate win. We get the absolute life-saving win we need. And we get the energy access that often starts people on a journey, right? Step one is getting access. But other things happen when you start power that go beyond the ecosystems that we can directly contribute to. They take off by themselves, which is a, a, one reason of, 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 I'll get to a second on how we're trying to get there. So I also should mention, by the way, in the time of COVID, half of the vaccines go wasted because of the lack of cold chain, which you need power for. So we, USAID, uh, our administrator, Samantha Power, launched for us about six, seven months ago what we call the Health uh, Care Electrification and Telecommunication Alliance. So when we took back and took those pilot lessons I, I, I mentioned, the 8.2 million, the 223 clinics we did, and we said, okay, we got some lessons learned, but this is a really thorny problem set. First of all, we don't know the health sector. So we immediately went to our global health colleagues in USAID and beyond and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do this. I think you're going to want to do it with us. And the top line indicators we're going to have to measure our success are health indicators. I want to see reductions in, in, in maternal child health mortality. I want to see improvement in PEPFAR indicators. I want to see improvement in PMI. And then, of course, we'll measure the climate. Or we'll measure the energy access we bring. But we'll also measure how we do it because we have to make sure this is a climate smart decarbonization play. So we put forward what we call a global development alliance. This is fancy procurement talk for saying we don't have all the answers. And if we say we do, don't believe us, <laughs> because this is, a, this is the failure of the development community at times. We kind of come, and because of the rules we have, which are there for good reason, we go into a back room, we design a program, someone comes out, says they can do it for X amount of money, and we say, good luck, let's go for it, and we measure it. This time we said, we have some of the answers. We'll put them out there publicly. We did a very formal, what we call request for information, where we put out information we knew. And we said, the rest of you have to do this, because it's not just development partners that got to be part of this. We started putting a, 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 a striating the... the, the the, the potential partnership base we had, and it was very interesting. It's people who work at the Ministries of Health. It's development partners, it's NGOs, but no one else it is. It's aligned businesses. It's the telecoms who service the tower, who can then maybe potentially sustainably service those, cell, those, those solar panels on top of the solar clinics to make sure they don't rust the next time we go do a site visit, right? It's other people who have the mandate to have business models around this. It's mini-grid operators. If you don't know what a mini-grid is, it's basically this idea of decentralized power. Most clinics we're talking about here, those 100,000, they're not on a grid, or their grid's not reliable, or their grid is never going to get there. So we're looking at all kinds of solutions with solar-backed uh, power and energy where we can do decentralized systems, okay? So these, these companies have an entire mandate to try to figure this out. This is also a backdoor for community electrification. So if you put it on a spectrum, on one side you might have a single clinic with a panel, all the way over to full community electrification for now hundreds of households, with an anchor health clinic who probably couldn't get the money by themselves because it's very hard to lend to a health clinic in a public health system that probably doesn't have adequate financial management, wrapped in with other productive uses like agriculture, water and sanitation, and as I mentioned before, telecommunications. And now all of a sudden you're building a business model. So the heart of this is bankable. And that's super and critical important to us because at the end of the day, none of us have enough money to keep paying for this over and over again. The countries don't, donors don't, the partners don't. So we gotta figure out a way to make this bankable. Bankable at first, sustainably, 
eventually, right? And that's a big point. Don't mix those two words up in the financial world. One means I can probably find people to invest in this with a subsidy. Every dollar I spend, every dollar we spend, we're subsidies. We're going into a market system with U.S. taxpayer dollars, mine, yours, others, and saying we believe in this for a reason, but we want to bank that subsidy on something we know can become sustainable. So we benchmark ourselves to market practices, and we see, so how do you take a clinic that, when we first started, had no chance of getting dollars to become electrified to a way where we can start thinking through those innovative pilots, ways that we can eventually make them bankable and put the private sector, their innovation, their ingenuity, their resources, into and know-how into it. So back to that Global Development Alliance. That means we bring some of the money. We've done that. We just awarded two weeks ago, so very proud to say about six months after we launched it, we already have an operational platform. We've already leveraged about $150 million. And those resources then, because the way the GDA, the Global Development Alliance, works for us is we can eschew that competition principle if someone shows they have skin in the game, that they're, there for their, they're not there for our dollar. In fact, in this conversation, we like people to come to us and say, here's what I can contribute. It's not about here's what you can give me because you have to have the reason to want to get this done to get this done, and it's going to take a lot more money than USAID is ever going to be able to put at it. But we can be that glue. We can be the platform. We can do the M&E. We can be the organizers. So that announcement was in the form of uh, announcing that Apt Associates, uh, one of our NGO partners, is going to be the ringleader, Resolve, Orange, um, and, and a few others are already on there. We're going to announce 15 more at COP. So it's already a partnership of already 20 organizations, and we hope to grow this thing. The beauty about the GDA is I can talk about it without getting myself in trouble. We always joke at AID, there's very few things you can't do. One of them is talk about procurements before they hit the street. This is now a global development alliance. I'm encouraging people to come, talk to me afterwards, talk to our colleagues. We'll figure out how you can get involved. We've talked about all those different kind of partners. We're trying to make this almost to the point of plug and play. Where do you want to work? What geographies? And then that partner of ours is out there making the patchwork quilt. At the end of the day, each square can be, you want to do 45 clinics or 500 clinics in Nigeria. You want to work with a single operation uh, mini-grid model. You have uh, partnerships through the uh, AID uh, health program. You want to work in maternal, maternal child health supported clinics. Great. Let's work it out. Oh, you're a resource partner. You have four or five million dollars you want to put toward this because it's part of your mandate. Great. We'll pair you up. And we start doing all that work to make sure the tapestry works not only as a square, but as a quilt, right? So I'll stop there. I know we're out of time. I guess the one thing I would end on is that you know, everyone talks about, and I started with how this is cross-sectoral, the, the, the multipliers of, of climate, right? Climate resilience, climate finance, and climate mitigation. This is all three. Rarely in my career have I done one where I'm, it's a win, 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 and I feel like you don't even have to sell the thing. On some level, distributed renewable energy systems are more resilient. There's no thousands of kilometers of, of transmission line to get hit by a tree or wiped out in a storm. They're easier to replace, and they're easier to maintain, and they're easier to manage. And we can create jobs, by the way, way more jobs in renewable energy than there are in fossil fuels. Way more gendered jobs, by the way, as well. The representation of women in these industries is much higher than in fossil fuels. Something else we're quite proud of uh, at Power Africa that we support. So that's number one. Climate finance. You know, I think we're going to get to a spot where we're actually going to be able to securitize this. We're going to be able to do enough on enough scale that funding and funds will be part of this equation in step two. So there's ways that, that big, big and small finance can get after this. And I think that's critical. And then finally, climate mitigation. Sometimes, as my team likes to call it, the power of the tower. One really great example of the last two is working with telecom tower companies. So on, I mentioned this kind of a bit in passing earlier, but just about every telecom tower in Africa is powered by diesel. And there are a lot of them. I forget the statistic. I wish I had it on top of my head. Nigeria alone, the number of towers that they're trying to replace is something like, I kid you not, million, 17 million or something liters of, of, of diesel a month. I, I, I absolutely butcher that statistic. Don't quote me. I get to the real one if you want to. But whatever it is, it's mind-blowing. And I'm like, God, it really puts in proportion of what we're trying to get done. So all of a sudden now we have HETA partner Orange successfully demonstrating how a cell tower powered by renewable energy can also be part of that health clinic electrification process, right? And now I think it's that kind of thing that inspires the largest cell provider in Nigeria to now try to think about turning all 1,000 of those, I think 17,000 if I'm not mistaken, to diesel power generators to clean energy. These are absolutely win, 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 win solutions. And if you heard the guy, uh, Nick, earlier from, um, from the UK, we need about kiloton examples of this stuff. These are big swatches, but guess what? We're excited about that. You should be too. But if you're a health practitioner, you're excited because where we started was better health outcomes from the very beginning. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I enjoy how you, you turned this into a sales pitch.
But we're very excited about the achievements, the accomplishments that Power Africa already has had through the Health Facility Electrification Project, and especially with this alliance. And as you heard, if anyone's interested in partnering, find Mark afterwards. Um, I know we are out of time, but I do hope that you all enjoyed hearing some of these examples of what we're working on in the health sector to address climate change, both on, on all three levels, the mitigation, adaptation, and finance. So thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your COP experience. Thank you all for coming to the U.S. Center. We have a busy rest of the afternoon here. From 4 to 4.30 is open exhibit time here at the U.S. Center, so feel free to take some time out and head over to the other side of the U.S. Center. We have Al uh, Alyssa Connaughton from the Colorado State University over at the green tablecloth table over there giving you a tour of the art exhibit for the next 30 minutes, as well as you can do some VR experience over at the Meta Immersive Learning Area. At 4.30, we'll have a NASA Hyperwall talk here with Dr. Tahaini Amir. Um, and then at 5 to 5.30, another open exhibit time. Come here and check it out. And then at 5.30 is our next side event on reducing emissions from cooking to achieve nationally determined contribution or NDC goals. That's going to be at 5.30 here at the U.S. Center. Thank you once again for coming.
Hello everyone, welcome to the U.S. Center. I'm very excited to introduce our next NASA Hyperwall presentation, the GLOBE program, Engaging Youth and Citizen Scientists in Understanding Our Environment. Dr. Tahani Amer. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, th thank you for coming for, to the GLOBE. Uh, this is a very phenomenal program that we have at NASA. That GLOBE is a partnership between NASA uh, National Science Foundation, uh, National Ocean and Ad Atmospheric Administrations, and the State Department. It's a great program to engage students and uh, citizen science to be able to do an activity to measure, to do some measurement observations to understand climate. And what's really GLOBE stands for is a GLOBE learning and observations benefiting environment. And it's a very important program for us. Now, before we do talk about GLOBE, we want to talk about earth science and how important earth science is. And as you know, NASA has a very unique vantage point looking at Earth from space. And we have about 24, 25 satellites that looking at Earth uh, uh, from space that measures, you know, land, ice, atmosphere, and oceans. And it's really, I really, I, will, I love this one here because it shows all our uh, satellites plus the, uh, the, our international space station that has a lot of instrumentation that measures uh, uh, activity on Earth. Now, wh what else do we do in here? This one here that uh, we have a lot of simulation that shows uh, wind, uh, surface temperature. Every satellite has a different function and has a different observation that makes us look at Earth. And what we need to do, we verify some of this data from ground. And that's what the, the students and the teacher and the citizen science do for us. And this is just a beautiful uh, a simulation of all the satellites that I showed you that collect these uh, images and observations to give you this beautiful simulations. And this is specifically here for sea surface temperature. As you can see, all changes. This is from actual data. Now, the next charts will show you uh, the, our Landsat uh, satellites that's looking at Earth and taking some measurements. And it's really looking for the, the health of vegetations. And look how, how wonderful that and how focused this is. And we have several uh, decades of satellites for Landsat specifically that look as land like that. And since here we're in Africa, we got the area of the Nile and uh, Africa. That's not, that's not me? Okay, this is not me. So this is another one that, that shows up the, actually the, the ocean activity and the land vegetation. And looks how much is the detail of this that really looking from all our satellites. And I want to make the connection between our satellites and our GLOBE uh, program that students and teachers and citizen science work on. Now, we don't only uh, look at Earth from space, we look at Earth from different places. We have, they have a major satellite that I showed you that goes around Earth. We have the ISS, International Space Stations. We have some uh, different level, we have different activity that will do that. We have CubeSats, and we have like, with citizen science, we'll do like from smartphone, and activity like this on polars, UVAs, and airborne. And we have students program that involve in all these activity. Some of them are graduate students, some of them undergrad, and some of them from K through 12. And with the program, the GLOBE, it focuses mostly in student and teacher, so mostly like K through 12. But NASA has different level of program even to post that. And uh, we get involved in all of this uh, measurement that to verify our data from space. Now, let's go to GLOBE program. What do you think of this vivid picture and exciting the new scientists, uh, the future scientists? The, all this is part of our GLOBE in 2019. They had a meeting, and we have all these students involved in. And each country can do that. And I love this picture. Look how diverse it is. 
So now, where is uh, our activity with GLOBE? You can see it's international. We have them on all continent, and everybody's involved in this activity. And that's why science connects all of us together and understanding our earth and climate changes. We need everybody to support us and help us. And look at this map, and look at everybody involved. If you don't see your country, you need to ask the question why, and maybe connect with your local representative so you can be in this map. Now, we have what we really do in the GLOBE program. It is really get developed the protocol for to do actual science, to actually measure the soil, the uh, cloud, or, uh, or the, uh, the atmosphere, be able to do that. We develop those protocols and share it with the students, with the teachers, and citizen science. And they have a lot of training program. If you are interested in that, they can train you to be able to do, be able to do this activity. And all this protocol, and you can go to our website that has it in there. Not only that, it's, look at the case through 12, you have some kind of material, educational material that you can use for students. So the teachers and the person that's doing for science be able to download all this for free online to be able to use in your classroom. So it's very simple, very easy. And we wanted to get the new generation started science early on, not just in college. We want it from K all the way to postdocs to be able to help us. Don't you love this picture? Next one is, um, this is actually the actual, uh, the done visualizations in 20, I believe 2019, 26 country was involved in this. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh. And I'll go back. Can I go back? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> and th those was kind of, it was like kind of a, 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 a at a time to be able to look at the soil from different places, and we have participation of about 26,000 manual be able to measure the soil across between teacher and student across the whole globe. And this was a big deal to the program. It was really very, the, it was very successful, and we're able to verify and validate the data from ground from the students. So it was really nice to have all of this. Next one is just not only teaching the student to do our protocol and do measurement, we teach them to share their science and be able to be an early scientist. And here is, you can see the excitement of that young gentleman there talking about his research with the adults. Now, so we, uh, this is something that anybody can download, which is our uh, Globe Observer apps, which is free. Everybody can download that and be able to see. And then you can, each one of you can go and uh, do this activity and be able to look at, at atmosphere, cloud, mosquito, land cover, and trees from our websites and be able to down, uh, upload. If you can take measurements, there is protocol that, that you can follow. And then you can put your data in the GLOBE website. It will be looked at by our scientists and verify and validate from our satellites. So, uh, but uh, the, the key here is to, to work with the student early on and give them how to do this. And that is really very difficult when you do it later on in college. You want to teach them this methodology and this scientific method early on. And this one here was... Uh, oh, no, I want to go back. I'm sorry. So this, some uh, data was taken, the dots that you see in there is actually as uh, students and teacher and uh, citizen science. And then the blue one, the big white swat, is our, uh, one of our Calypso, and the one is, is uh, modest. And then you can see measuring cloud, if it's cloudy or it's, uh, uh, or it's a clear sky. So you are actually looking this actual data from the globe uh, participants. And this is actual, the other one is from our satellite. So we are using this data. It is really beautiful, and it's nice to connect with, uh, with the actual uh, measurement in ground with our satellite. And this is another image that does that. And the student really get excited when they see their data or pictures being related to that. Now, so this is an activity that since we are here, the Near East and the North Africa regions, that they had this uh, uh, conference and they had all these children in Earth Day, which is very important to us, which we have that every year. And the students actually took a look at actual measurements 
into measure the soil and see what is is good for architecture, uh, agriculture or not. So this is pretty much the GLOBE uh, program. And if you are interested uh, it, for your country or your community to be involved in it, you'll be able to uh, connect with NASA GLOBE. And I wanted to thank my friend Allison. She's really the program manager for that. I'm just here to present it for you. And if you have any questions, let me know. And then we have uh, Salma here. She is a local representative of the program uh, in, in this area. So if you have any, uh, something related to the region, you can ask her. And I'm here to entertain any questions. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, really, it's an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, you uh, make it uh, very fun and very active <laughs> and uh, specific, really. I am very happy for that. Uh, so I want to tell you, if you need to be any uh, more information, you can go direct to globe.gov. It's a portal, a website, very huge. And you can find a lot of data about five areas uh, environment, uh, uh, our students, they work in, in it. Thank you very much, doctor. It's Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Any questions? I will also note that we have the GLOBE program open right now on the tabletop over there, so feel free to go learn more about it right over there. The website's open on that tabletop, oh. right beyond the green tablecloth table. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have some NASA swag back there if you'd like to get some. Once again, thank you for coming to the U.S. Center. Our next event and the last side event here for the day is at 5.30. Reducing emissions for cooking, from cooking to achieve nationally determined contribution or NDC goals. Again, that's going to be here at the U.S. Center at 5.30. Reducing emissions from cooking to achieve nationally determined contribution or NDC goals. In the meantime, feel free to sit up here or at the chairs here over at the high top tables. Check out the art exhibit, the First Movers Coalition. Peace. Yeah, the Yeah Network, as well as the Meta Immersive Learning Area, too. Thank you once again for coming to the U.S. Center.
Hello, and please take your seats. We're about to begin. Thank you. Welcome to Reducing Emissions from Cooking to Achieve Nationally Determined Contribution Goals. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage Dan Kamen, Professor of Sustainability, UC Berkeley, and former science envoy, Obama administration. Well, I'd like to thank you all for being here. This is a particularly exciting event on a couple different levels. Um, the first, of course, is that we have an absolutely incredible set of speakers, two ministers, EPA administrator, head of the Clean Cooking Alliance. It's a unique event. I'll introduce our, our panelists briefly. But I'll, let me say a few words just to highlight why what we're seeing today is a remarkable collaboration around both the NDC's decarbonization and energy and racial and social justice. And that's a combination that many of us have talked about for a long time, but putting that into operation is a whole nother story. We've seen announcements of the African carbon market. We've seen efforts by the climate youth to bring things together. And here we have a panel that can really highlight how we're gonna do these, these various features. So I'll highlight a little bit about what we're going to hear, and then we'll get right into two rounds of questions with the panelists. I have a couple thank yous I want to make. Um, my, my former boss, uh, Mark Corrado, head of Power Africa, is here. I'd like to thank John Mitchell from the EPA, Alexander Nunez, all of whom have been champions for climate justice. Damalolo Ugenbi is, of course, the champion of energy access, of which this is a critical part of the story. And as someone who has worked on cook stoves in Central America and in East Africa for now three and a half decades, it is remarkable to see what became of what was initially a really a humble effort to work from the thermodynamics to the monitoring to the health and energy, to see this now at a level where in our recent summit in Ghana just a month ago, we had over 800 participants in the science, the justice, the outreach, the energy and environmental impacts of these technologies. So today with us, we have James Grabert, um, Director of Mitigation Efforts at the UNCCC. Uh, we have Kandi Yumkela, one of the founders of this process um, at Sustainable Energy for All. And we also have with us uh, Dr. Kwako Afraye, the Minister of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation, and a farmer from Ghana. And I have to admit, as someone who's been in and out of US government, you have the title that I most envy of anyone in terms of the package of, of connections here. We have um, um, Minister of Energy, um, Miner um, Minerals and Development, the Honorable Ruth uh, Nakanbirwa, who is also here with us today. And we will start off with comments from something I'm really honored to see, who is a champion of environmental quality, environmental justice. He just launched an environmental justice initiative within the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the, admini uh, the administrator of EPA, Michael Reagan. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Really uh, appreciate that. I'm excited to join all of you at COP27 to discuss the ways that we can collectively uh, reduce emissions from cook stoves and achieve our NDC. It's an honor to participate on this panel with such distinguished leaders who are making great strides to reduce climate, uh, health, and gender inequity, and work towards universal access to clean energy and clean cooking. For the past two years, the Biden administration has made strong and clear statements that the United States is once again a climate leader. At the same time, the United States is striving to advance environmental justice and deliver climate and health equity to our most vulnerable populations and our most underserved communities. As we do so, 
our interagency household energy initiative enables the United States to partner with other country governments and local and international partners around the world to reduce air pollutant emi emissions and the resulting climate impacts from household energy use. At the Climate Leaders Summit last year, I announced the Biden administration would resume and strengthen our commitment to the United Nations Foundation's Clean Cooking Alliance, as well as work with other country governments and partner throughout the world to reduce emissions from home cooking that contribute to climate change and directly affect the health and the livelihoods of approximately 30 percent of the world's population. In Glasgow last year, I also had the opportunity to participate on a panel focused on advancing clean energy access to households for climate and health equity. So I'm pleased to be back with the cooking. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with the Clean Cooking Alliance CEO, Dimfa, Dimf, Dimfna uh, Vanderlaans today. After joining remotely last year, it's a real pleasure to join you in person. And Dimfna, congratulations on co-hosting the Clean Cooking Forum last month with the government of Ghana. While I was unable to join, my colleagues went on a number of site visits to homes to see how people cooked in Accra, Accra and talked with cooks about their thoughts on transitioning from cooking with charcoal and wood to cleaner fuels like LPG, electricity, and ethanol for climate and health benefits. I'm also excited to have the opportunity to be here to highlight this important climate, gender, and health equity issue and to discuss strides made over the past year and plans for the future. The impacts of cooking with polluting stoves and fuels are, stoves are well known, but bear repeating whenever we discuss this issue to ground us in the enormous reality of those impacts and inspire all of us to take bold action. Almost 2.4 billion people, or a third of the world's population, cook their food with, with open fires or rudimentary stoves. It's estimated that greenhouse gas emissions from non-renewable wood stoves, wood fuels for cooking, represent about 2% of the global CO2 emissions, on par with CO2 emissions from aviation and from shipping. Climate equity is but one important reason to reduce emissions from household energy. Gender and health equity are also powerful reasons as well. The World Health Organization estimates that the emissions from household energy pr practices expose people to extraordinarily high levels of household air pollution that cause approximately 3.2 million premature deaths worldwide every single year. An estimated two-thirds of these premature deaths are from direct exposure to indoor air pollution, primarily among women and girls, and one-third are from the household energy contribution to ambient air pollution. Other impacts from household energy use include the loss of productive opportunities for women and girls who usually bear the burden of collecting the fuel as well as doing most of the cooking. Additionally, using wood and charcoal to cook has grave impacts on our forest, one of the world's most precious resources. Up to 34 percent of wood fuel harvested is unsustainable and contributing to climate change. To address these multiple serious impacts, we need global leadership, and we also need country-level leadership. We need leaders who are taking ambitious action and developing and implementing innovative plans to show other countries what can be achieved with passion, focus, and commitment. So I'm delighted that Dr. Kwaku Afria, the Minister of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation from Ghana, and the Honorable Ruth Nan Kabirwa, Minister of Energy and Mineral Development from Uganda, are on the panel today to discuss multiple actions their countries are taking to reduce emissions from cooking and household energy to achieve their NDC climate goals. One of our goals today, in addition to highlighting the multiple impacts of household energy use, is to encourage more countries to follow the lead of nations like Ghana and Uganda and take action and move forward rapidly to implement emission reduction activities. And as that happens, and as more countries join together in action, we can move forward collectively to achieve the sustainable development goals for universal access to clean energy and clean cooking. To address all the challenges that I've outlined, the United States government has been developing a whole-of-government approach 
involving multiple agencies and multiple departments across our federal government. We're doing research and testing on stoves and fuels in our household energy lab and in the field and helping to build the capacity of regional stove testing and knowledge centers all around the world. Currently, we're engaged with the Clean Cooking Alliance and working closely with the CSIR lab in Ghana and the CREEC lab in Uganda and other testing labs on a round-robin stove research and testing initiative. We've also been working with partners to develop and then disseminate ISO standards for clean cooking and clean, clean cooking and clean cooking solutions. We've been engaging policymakers and stove testing experts from countries throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America to assist them to adopt or adapt these international ISO cook stove standards into national policy. And again, Ghana and Uganda are at the front forefront of countries taking action on standards implementation and building the regulatory framework to promote cleaner fuels and stoves. This past year, we worked with the partners to pilot a science to policy academy in East Africa to support development and implementation of clean cooking policy goals identified by the national stakeholders with the best available science. And we're also building on this science and understanding of the one of the on the ground realities by translating our research into policy development and implementation. We're working with partner countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we're promoting private sector-led solutions to replace charcoal with LPG, an important bridge fuel for more sustainable, clean fuel solutions. And in, and in Malawi, our modern cooking for healthy forest activities, co-funded with the UK Foreign Commonwealth and the Development Office, has designed and launched a clean cooking fund. On the policy side, we have strong support. We have strongly supported a G20 energy and climate ministerial commitment to provide clean cooking facilities and ensure that everyone, including the most vulnerable populations, enjoy universal access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all as a key driver to generate inclusion. Countries have also come to Sharm El Sheikh to discuss how to strengthen their commitments to reduce emissions in their NDCs. We're working with partners to support governments that have already included household energy in their NDCs, and we're supporting these governments by providing guidance on implementation and providing harmonized approach to monitoring, reporting, and verification activities, which DIMPNA will discuss in more detail. So I'm, I'm just excited to be joined by this ex excellent panel of leaders, and I'm looking forward to learning from their many years of experience and expertise, as well as understanding how their leadership on the ground can generate engagement, action, and results from more countries. Thank you all. So the administrator did part of my job for me because in the rush to highlight the conference, I didn't formally introduce Dimpna Vanderlas as well. You heard it here, but she is the, um, the CEO of the Clean Cooking Alliance, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. So we're going to try to do two rounds of questions, and so how disciplined we are on the answers determines how far we get. Um, so James, let me begin with you. Um, uh, as, a, as a gray beard, you and I in this field, um, I remember when the battle over building the Sustainable Development Goals was actually a question whether energy would be its own category. And cooking was not clearly placed anywhere until we had that. Can you speak a little bit about how the work at the UN um, FCCC highlights cooking as part of those national strategies? Because this is really an exciting uh, advance for me in terms of how we think about whole of whole of energy system solutions, but can you get us started on that? Okay, well, the reason we are interested in this, I would say, is uh, th threefold. I think the first the administrator has addressed, um, a, third of the, a third of the world not having access um, or, or accessing uh, in an unsustainable way, creating 2% of emissions. That's the first thing. Um, we also know 50% of black carbon is coming from this, and we know that that's a short-lived, uh, uh, with huge Im impacts on, on climate, 100 times more than CO2. Um, so we know we need to address this. The numbers tell us that. We also know it's a 
three, four, five billion something, a huge number of people who don't have the access. Um, this is just is not right. This is something we have to address. It's about the people the, having that access to things that are, are better for them, healthier, um, better ways of living. Um, and we know now most likely we're going to be set back by about 100 million people who are going to be accessing, going back to accessing wood fuel because of the energy crisis. Um, and then, the, so those are the, two, the, the, the numbers, the people. And then thirdly, I would say, I think this is an area where you're just highlighting, it, it, it is something that needs both national and international stakeholders, actors across all parts of society and economy. It's, it's, one, of, it's probably one of the you know, more perfect examples of what we talked about in Paris, about cooperative efforts, everyone being involved. This is you know, the one perhaps we all should be aiming for. And I think the numbers uh, from what I've seen tell us that we need universal access to clean cooking by 2030. We just need it if and we're going to be on a one point five, and we're not the, on is pace. Is the key thing to really highlight yeah. here? Yeah. So. so I can say that we're about what we've seen in the NDCs, or I don't know if you want to come back to that. Yeah, let me or, just. Uh, so maybe the follow-on question then is that people are generally good at big system models, power plants, and things, but not so good at including the social side in the in the NDCs and the national direct contributions. How do, how can that fit in? I mean, is the modeling efforts that come through the IPCC reports a place that really can reflect that accurately? Uh, well, what we've seen in the, in the NDCs, I think I've had the numbers here in front of me, we've seen roughly, we have, uh, I think, 66 countries that have, have somehow referred to this. Um, but we know there are 128 countries that, that don't have universal access. Um, less than half of those um, have targets, and less than half of those have actual universal targets by 2030. So we're nowhere near what's... Um, and then we're not, all, we're not seeing this reflected well in, in, in the policies that are in DCs. Um, yes, the data issues, the modeling issues are part of the problem, but I think it's, it's the lack of, of, of um, ability to really prepare and, and, and roll out something that really is so local and so individual, and it's, it's not easy for countries, and they need the support. Um, and I think that's why some of the initiatives and efforts that have been made have shown that we can do it. We just need to do more of it. I, I think it, it's ripe, ripe for action. So. Well, as one, of, as one of your IPCC coordinating the authors, I, I want to receive that as a direct mission to say we need to reflect the household sector and the impacts on gender and youth more directly in this. So thank you for doing that. Um, Minister Afraya, I'd like to highlight um, both a little bit of what motivated Ghana to make this a core part of the story, but also how you see this working in to the, um, to the overall transition plan in Ghana in terms of the clean cooking contribution to the Ghanaian national strategy. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. When I come to forums such as this, I'm amazed at how we tend not to think about very important and very yet mundane, I'll use the word humility. <laughs> you know, cook stoves uh, or uh, open Fuel, use of fuel with no open in Africa is the norm. And especially in rural settings and even peri-urban settings where electricity penetration is very, very low. But to answer your question directly, maybe some statistics will help. 78% of Ghana's total black carbon emission uh, uh, is contributed by, by uh, wood and charcoal stoves, which are very, very, and then open burning of charcoal. And of the total black carbon emissions for cooking, 74% were from rural households, particularly in the forest regions. So, and then whereas the remaining 20% were from urban settings. Forest, this is very, very important because the pressure on the forest People uh, have made a uh, tribution to farming, yes, cocoa farming, co uh, uh, rubber plantations, oil palm, but fuel wood cultivate, uh, you know, uh, harvesting also contributes a lot to the problem. And then another aspect too is the health problems. I'm by profession a public health physician, probably trained in Tulane, in New Orleans. But suffice to say that I 
have witnessed a lot of, you know, uh, diseases which are attributable to uh, lung diseases, particularly women and even young ch female children, because by uh, our culture, they are almost always in the kitchen. It's changing these days, but I must qualify. So there's a lo uh, habitat loss, and then also biodiversity uh, loss. It's also contributed by, you know, women and children harvesting from the forest. So this intervention for us, Ghana, is very, very important from the health point of view. And also, even though our contribution to the uh, climate issue, um, uh, 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 carbon emission is very low, I must confess, 0 0.05. But when you do the attribution, you will see that, you know, a, a burning of fuel in the open also makes a, a significant contribution. So in order to avert all the catastrophes uh, that is you know, looming, we believe that when we mount an assault on this area and then also get an uh, you know, efficient uh, you know, source of fuel for household chores, that would be good for Ghana. Okay. Now, I mean, again, I'm referring back to your sort of title of minister also for innovation. Ghana's taken a lead role in partnering and conducting studies to really understand the health impacts that you mentioned, the young girls, the food impacts. Are there some other programs in Ghana that you want to mention in terms of this connection between household energy, health, development? Yes, uh, I, I am a very much aware, but you must understand the governance system. This program actually, the contribution would have been better if the Minister for Energy were here. Still, I am very, very much aware of the programs that are, are running. In fact, we have, uh, even with the Swiss government, we have uh, done the NDCs, the bilaterals, and they, they are providing cookstoves. Uh, and then, of course, with the uh, U.S., and that we are making sure that uh, households, I think, if my memory serves me right, uh, in, in, over a million people are set up to uh, get access to cook stoves. But unfortunately, even though I'm the environment minister, all details are suggested in the uh, uh, Minister for Energy. That's how it works out in Ghana. But we collaborate a lot, and then uh, we are very well aware of what is happening. Thank you so much. Okay. Minister Nakabura, a similar question for you. Can you highlight how clean cooking fits into the NDCs in Uganda and how you see that as kind of a, a holistic strategy for the country. Um, thank you very much. Good evening to you all. I will answer the question, but allow me to clearly remind everybody where Uganda stands in as far as the energy transition is concerned. First of all, in Uganda's energy mix, we have 90 plus percent renewable and green energy from hydropower, from solar. We have only one plant which uses thermal power to generate 50 megawatts as a security plant. When we have a shortfall, then we call for generation from this plant. So when you talk about energy transition, Uganda does not have uh, thermal power plants that generate that uh, uh, power from the fossil fuel. So what is Uganda's problem? Uganda's problem is clean cooking. And so I am in the right place, and this Clean Cooking Alliance must manifest into a real marriage. This is where I want to stay because I see how Ugandans, including my mother, we used to cook using firewood. Firewood, not even charcoal. Charcoal was a high standard for us, but firewood. Do you know how painful it is to cut down a tree? just to cut down a tree. But matters become worse when you burn that tree.
to get charcoal. Worst still, when you burn that charcoal to get fire. So this is what Africa is suffering. So in Uganda, when we talk about transition, we want to transit from using charcoal to a cleaner source of food, fuel. And I want to thank the U.S. I want to thank the CEO, the U.S. government, with whom we are working to make sure that we do research to see how the dark emissions are being reduced by improving on the way we cook. So Uganda has decided to develop our natural resources to get LPG. We, are, we have a program which we are working with. We have a company which is a government-owned company, Uganda Energy Credit Capitalization Company, which works with SMEs to sensitize them, to help them work out bankable projects which can help them come up with technologies that can help in improving in our cooking styles. So we are into LPG, gas cylinders. We are distributing, so far we've distributed 15,000 gas cylinders free, including the cooking facility, the stoves, free because we have to really work on the adaptation. People fear gas. It is dangerous, but it can be used. So we are distributing the gas cylinders, and we know that when we begin producing our own LPG by 2025, we will have that source of LPG. But we are also coming up with uh, other energy-saving cooking stoves, where SMEs are manufacturing the cooking stoves from clay. So that even if you were to use charcoal, but instead of using a tin of charcoal, at least you use three pieces of charcoal to cook a meal. As we transit, we have to look for all these new technologies to save on the energy. In as far as uh, energy cooking using electricity is concerned, we announced a special cooking tariff, a special tariff, more affordable. And we are trying to tell people not to fear using electricity, to cook using electricity. Because affordability is key. We are making people access clean energy, access electricity. But is this electricity affordable? Is the tariff affordable? It's not affordable because we borrow money at high interest rates to invest into electricity generation, and that will have a bearing on the end user tariff. It will contribute 60% of the cost of electricity. So clean cooking, yes, we are at it. And once Uganda reduces um, the cutting down of trees by providing for better facilities for cooking, for sure your research, which you are doing, will indicate that the emissions, however little emissions that Uganda has been emitting, will be tremendously reduced. And, and I just want to highlight for those who aren't cooking aficionados in the audience, because having this holistic strategy. I was living in Western Uganda in Fort Portal for some time, working with Cree, the research institute that you mentioned, administrator at Macquarie University. And one of the big challenges was charcoal, manu charcoal manufacturing illegally in areas where you shouldn't to be transported to the cities, not only in Uganda, but also elsewhere. And so the fact that you're doing more efficient stoves introducing electric cooking, which my research group at Berkeley says is a true leading opportunity, but few places are trying it out. It, that's a remarkable portfolio. So I just want to thank you and kind of acknowledge how unique and how forward thinking that really is. Let me turn to Dimfna, and I'd like you to do two things if you don't mind. One is that you are sort of the rock star of cooking, 
the Julie Child, the whoever you want to highlight all together, because everyone I know who wants to build clean cooking, gender equity into their national plans comes to you and to Donnie and to Julie and the team. Can you just first introduce the Clean Cooking Consortium? Maybe say a word about the meeting we just had in Ghana. Then I'll come back to you for one second round before I come back to the administrator. Sure. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I promise everybody in the audience I will not stand up and show you my best dance moves. I will not do that. Um, and I do appreciate being referenced in the same sentence as Julia Childs because I do love cooking very, very much. So i um, delighted to be here. It's really wonderful to see so many people here. Um, to answer your question, the first question about what we do, the Clean Cooking Alliance, I am indeed the CEO. I have the honor and privilege of being there almost five years now. Um, I have a fantastic team and amazing partners that we work with because we do come at this at a real deep sense of humility. And I think it's important to note that because this is such a big issue that gets too little funding and too little attention that we have to work through all of our partners to make sure that this gets the attention and the funding that it does deserve and it does need, not for us, but for all the women out there who are still continuing to collect firewood and by cooking over open fires are really hurting themselves and their children, which is honestly unacceptable. Like, I cannot believe we actually have to have this conversation, to be really honest. Like, it's like... We've been having it for decades. For though. decades, and it's no more. I'm, like, really done with it. Like, we have to... I have to be out of a job in a couple of years, and if I don't do that, then we've collectively failed, really. So, um, I was... This is my third cup. I was... Um, yeah. So, the first cup that I went to, there was one event on clean cooking. One single event. And we all know, just looking around, how many events there are at COP. The second COP I went to in Glasgow, there were about 10 events um, that were focusing on clean cooking, which is already a tremendous progress. This time, myself and my team, we have to divide and conquer to make sure that we're at all the events present where clean cooking is addressed and discussed. And mostly because we've really been successful in embedding conversations around clean cooking, not just with SDG 7, but with the food systems and with the nature-based solution systems and when we're thinking about women lens investing, like all of this is connected. We cannot separate these conversations out anymore and we need a whole systems approach to address this issue then. So, so I'm going to come back to the administrator on what whole systems means to the U.S. government, but can you also say a little bit about um, how you as a partner to many countries, NGOs, community groups, um, really focus on this whole monitoring verification process, which is so critical to get clean cooking on the same footing as modeling building efficiency yeah. or integration of renewables into the grid. What does that mean in practice? Because that's good words, but it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. And I think more than anything, what we have done as an organization is listen to the requests of government officials that we get almost all the time. And two of their fantastic leaders are with us here today. And so... It is quite easy to write a sentence that says, my government wants to increase access to clean cooking. It is a lot harder to create a roadmap and a plan behind that to actually execute and implement that. It is a lot harder to create the right monitoring and verification systems, creating a baseline from where you can start to then start monitoring and verifying that you're actually making progress towards meeting those targets, it's, it's a lot of work, it's complicated, and like, I'm sure you, you would be the first person to talk about that, like it's a complicated process, and governments need all the support that they can get to make sure that they're able to create an appropriate plan, have the right ways of monitoring and verifying that they're making the targets towards meeting those plans, and so the Clean Cooking Alliance with many of our partners um, are really focusing on making sure that we're providing capacity to these countries so that they can actually increase their ambition around clean cooking. And so we did that initially to just work with them that, to make sure that that sentence was included. Sometimes we just need the one sentence that is like the hook so that we can continue to work with these countries. But now, as you are referencing, more than 60 countries have clean cooking targets in their NDCs, but now they're going to need our support to actually create the most appropriate plans around that. But more importantly, they are going to need all of our support to then access the finance, the climate finance, to implement and execute these plans. Because a plan, even if it's based on solid data and has the right 
monitoring and verification behind it. A plan means nothing unless there is funding to execute the plans in Uganda and Ghana and all these other countries in, in the global south. So we can talk a little bit more about why the climate finance is so crucial. But come back to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Administrator Reagan, let me ask you, because you highlighted, I mean, you provided some fantastic information about how the U.S. government is partnering on the research, on the development side, but I was not, never been more thrilled when I saw you launch this new environmental justice office at EPA. Can you highlight just a little bit of what it means to take this kind of whole of government approach and to recognize that until you acknowledge the environmental racism and injustice in many of these areas, you don't really come up with a holistic strategy for cooking, for bringing energy to underserved communities, both in the U.S. and internationally. Absolutely. I think it's on. It just sounds funny. Okay. Absolutely. I, I think that um, it's important that, first and foremost, we acknowledge what's occurring. Uh, too often when we think problems are really complex and we don't have an immediate solution, we have a tendency to bury them or pretend that they don't exist. So part of our goal for acknowledging environmental injustice and inequities is to call attention to something that individuals have been dealing with for decades, uh, if not forever. Um, acknowledging the problem, even if it's huge, is the first step. And then second, what we're seeing here on the stage is a great example of when you acknowledge a problem and look at it through the same collective lens, there are absolutely solutions to that problem. And you can think about different ways to talk about it. And we were talking earlier about, from our equity standpoint, uh, we should not disaggregate all of the benefits, whether it's an NDC, whether it's a gender issue, whether it's an air quality issue. We should highlight the multiple benefits because one of those talking points is going to land on someone in an audience that has, has a particular bent towards that. So um, this is exciting for, for us because we get a chance to work on a, a problem of injustice, inequity, uh, an issue that is disproportionately impacting women and girls, um, and acknowledge it for what it is and think about how we collectively combat it. It's exciting. Yeah, just a quick follow-up there, if I may. I so appreciate you saying that, Administrator Reagan, because it is a complicated issue. I acknowledge that. And people have been trying for decades to address it. I acknowledge that too. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't collectively really go for solving this issue. And so there are lingering doubts and lingering skepticism within this ecosystem that it's too complicated. We will never do it. There are no solutions. There's not enough money. There's no nonsense. It's like really, it's, it's not the case. We can do it and we have to do it. And to just say it's too complicated and therefore we're stepping away from it, not acceptable. Okay. If we can go to the moon, we can fix this. So I, I love to hear that. Thank you. So James, well, let me come back to you. It's a complicated issue, but the solution is very simple. So say more. What I'm saying, my insight into the issue is that, yes, the, the issues are very complicated. They are related the gender issues, the moral issues, the uh, NDC's climate change, biodiversity. But solution is very, very simple. Technology and finance. Simplicity. So that's actually what I, I agree. So I want to go to James on. So uh, j we, we had a session just uh, two, uh, yesterday where the presidents of Kenya and the presidents of Malawi got up and said, we are launching a climate finance, a carbon facility by and for Africa. And that really warmed my heart. How can, are using Article 6 or other mechanisms of the, of the UNCCC, how can we enable, bring the data so that African countries, the ministers who want to recognize cook stove projects, clean cooking projects, mini grid projects, your electrification, get on the same page as the mega projects? Well, I think in some way we've already shown that it can be done. In the last decade under the CDM, it's like 30 million CERs. 60% of all cook stove projects are in Africa. Um, it's, it, it is okay, it's not enough, we're nowhere near. But that experience also highlighted a lot of the difficulties and the alliances and uh, initiatives have stepped in to help improve and help do what needs to be done to get through these complexities. 
But these things are clearly bankable. And I think as we go forward, they'll be even more and more bankable. I don't think that's the issue. I think the money will flow. We just need to work and, and elaborating the, these efforts or these, these interests that are showing up in the NDCs and make them, make them coherent and, and, and implementable and, and engage. And I, I think the partners here, the proof is here. Um, and we've done what we can from the UNFCCC side in terms of the methodological work and, and, and constantly improving upon it. Um, I don't see why we don't do this. And, and to come back to the issues, it's, it's ten, 10 SDGs we're addressing here. It's not just about climate. We should just be doing this. So, so I'll turn to the ministers uh, for reactions in a second. But let me push you on one other feature there. And that is we've gone through a process of trying to understand and quantify the benefits marginal abatement curves, the new tool, which I'm very positive about because President Biden issued an executive order saying the U.S. will use a social cost of carbon going forward. It's finally cleared the courts. What are some of the analytic tools that you could tell the nerds like me at the IPCC that would be most effective in highlighting this? Because I still hear firms saying carbon credits, cooking, forest conservation, it's too... I don't believe it, but they say it's too mushy. I'd rather invest in a in a gigawatt solar project in Morocco than get yeah. it, down in the weeds. It's not perfect, and you know some of the, the 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 numbers that have been put forward are questionable, and we're trying to push back to make sure we have more reasonable estimates coming forward. Um, but even even with relatively low prices on carbon, we're seeing an uptake. We've seen a, a driving down of the price of these stoves. I mean, it's just going to get easier. Um, and I think, like I said, the partners, initiatives, us, everyone's working to make this even better. So I don't see why we can't move faster. And as I said at the beginning, it has to be universal by 2030. It, it, and, and under what we're doing now, which is a great effort, we're still going to be about 2 billion people. We right now we're on, projected we are, to still have 2 right. billion people in 2030. That's not acceptable. Yeah. We, we, we are not on pace. So Minister Nankoberi, you highlighted what I think is actually one of the, the, the special sauces. You said, we have a whole of cooking approach. We're supporting efficiency. We're supporting electrification. What are, can you give a little more background for what are some of the things that brought you to that position? Because that is not the global norm. I mean, you are way ahead of the curve on building that kind of portfolio and recognizing the effects on minority tribes and on women and on children. How did, how did this come together? Because I do think it's a model for others. Well, first of all, Uganda is known for her uh, gender policy, whereby every program that you bring cannot pass in cabinet or parliament without a certificate of gender compliance. So cooking is a gender issue in Africa. Cooking is a healthy issue in Africa. Cooking is a climate issue, okay, everywhere. So my advice is that uh, people should stop living in denial by cherry picking from the SDGs. Those UN SDGs were critically identified and they are all important. So if you were to handle cooking as a healthy issue, we have that SDG. If we had handle clean cooking as a gender issue, we also have an SDG on gender. In Africa, the girl child works with the mother in the kitchen. The girl child has to help the mother to go to the forest and get firewood. Where will she get time to do her prep work? Oh, I mean, this is a reality in Africa. So we have to make sure that we help the NGOs, we help the, the groups that are trying to come up with the better technologies that will save us. So Uganda has policies on gender. Uganda has policies on a girl child where we have affirmative action. We give bonus points to the girls to join the university. We give them 1.5 points free to join the university. So we do positive discrimination against boys. So, 
Those policies are very critical. They will help us in getting the finances that we need, whether we are dealing with health issues, or whether we are dealing with climate change issues, or whether we are dealing with gender issues. All those are SDGs, which we have to handle holistically. And, and I think it's really... And I think it's really key to highlight that. So when I did our first so stove project on the Kenyan-Ugandan border, we saw examples of families where the mother would carry the boy on the back longer than the girl we who was here. working. We are here. We can give yep. testimonies. We exactly. are here. We grew in it. You yep. know, we were with our mothers in the kitchen with our siblings on our backs. Exactly. I, I mean, this, these are not fantasies. These are not, you know... It is a reality. We still have people who are going through it in Africa. Whoever wants can come down to witness. So this problem is for real. Forests are diminishing. People are dying because of carbon emissions. Cancers are now on the high rise. This is a reality. Please. That's right. Minister Frey, let me turn to you. I have partnered for a while with Kumasi because there's researchers that are expert in air quality, in biofuels, and gasification. How did the, the strategy come together in, in Ghana to make cooking such a core part of the overall work? Well, that is why I, I repeat myself. When I come to forums such as this, I become very, very perplexed when apparently simple things and st things that are so self-evident, other people in other cultures think that they are very complicated. I don't see any complication in this matter. So it was very, very easy for us to enact policy to get to this stage. Because all the issues are clear. I agree with my younger sister here about what is happening in Uganda. It doesn't, it's not worth repeating it. But what happened in Uganda maybe apart from a few modifications here and there, well, it's the same factors that happen. I remember I'm a farmer and I'm, you know, essentially a rural person. And I've seen all these things. So there's a need for equity, for equality, and there's a need to solve the health problems. People in urban settings are having it a bit, a lot better than those of us living in rural areas. Electricity Ghana has advanced a lot, I must say. We have nearly 90% uh, penetration, but still the balance is skewed against the, the, the little that is left is, is to be made up in rural settings, a small island situation. So what I want to say is that, honestly, when you ask me that, that question, I really don't appreciate it because it's clear so the policy had to come together, and then we have to do programs uh, with the help of friends such as the USA to make sure that we move fast and that we have, look, I have all the goals set up uh, by 2030, all the goals set up here, yeah, maybe it's not worth repeating them. But to say that we have to make double quick time, and I, 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 at the peril of repeating myself, simple solutions and i can find parallels in the health sector where i know best when the global north europe and usa found out that polio was a very very big problem and the residual polio was in africa they marshaled a plan and they helped us and then you know polio virtually eliminated in africa same thing with smallpox i'm a health person so i can and this could stop matter which is aligned to climate issues, biodiversity issues, equality and equity issues, gender. We must solve them using simple solutions, and the simple solutions are an alliance of NGOs, civil society, government, international organizations working together so that we can eliminate that inequity, especially in rural and urban Africa. No, I mean, I appreciate you calling it out. In fact, one thing that the U.S. government has launched to try to be a partner is the so-called net zero world, where energy analytics and modeling to bring these things in 
so that we can really quantify the, the benefits of projects that don't get the attention they deserve, even if the solutions are obvious to those who see them every day. So we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to get people's reactions. I'll ask each of you um, in terms of this financing question. There's no question that it needs financing, that we've heard some really great statements of the conference so far. I hope we're going to hear more from certain heads of state, maybe arriving tomorrow afternoon. Um, but I'm hoping we'll get some comments about this. I may start with you, Dimfna, in terms of if you were to pick out an aspect of this problem where there's a barrier where we, we need to find a way to liberate more financing, what would it be? And, and I'll, I'll come down the list and come from Dimfna back to you to give you the last word, Administrator, but on financing as we close up. Sure, yeah. I think in the financing space, it's um, really, really easy to announce a pledge. But announcing a pledge means nothing if there isn't like a program behind it immediately to start dispensing the, the funds. So I think on the financing side, moving from pledges and announcements to actual programs that are being designed so that the, the funds can flow, making it easier for countries to access it, like removing some of the complexity to actually access some of that finance is going to be critical. And I think for clean cooking specifically to make sure that on the funding side, people do realize that there are so many impact areas, which is fantastic. So if you do a clean cooking program, you have all these different impact areas, as the ministers have already alluded to. Sometimes the funders are just interested in the single one impact area, whereas I, I would need them and I need them to be like thinking holistically about all of those impact areas so that they can do all of these actions that are, being, are, are required. Okay. James? Um, well, I would just take it to the next step, as I'll you said, you know, to, to do that understanding, have the programs and plans, okay. and then and then reach out to the UNFCCC or NDC partnership, um, and and talk and, and just ask how to get access. How can we facilitate? We're quite aware of what can be done, and we're there to help. And that's the next stage. And like I said, it's all bankable, so I don't think there's an issue. Very good. On, on the financing side. Um, well, in finance, well, in this forum, I realized that yesterday, for example, we talked about a possibility of a debt to climate swap, for example. Exactly. We could look at that and do the analysis. The details, I'm not a finance person. So, but I believe that it, it could work. And then we could also I, I appeal directly. I know U.S., for example, is a very general society crowdfunding, whatever arrangements that we can think of, people who want to help out every aspect of financing we should explore. And even amongst ourselves, yeah, there is a, an urban population in Accra, for example, they might not even appreciate the problem in rural Ghana. You'll be surprised. We could also appeal to them to help out. And I know that the African Development Bank has reached out to us as well. So, Ms. Kubira. Thank you very much. I hear about carbon credits, where people who own forests can trade in carbon. I think if we can borrow that and say people whom we want to stop invading the forests can also benefit from carbon credit, which they can use. To, to come up with these new technologies of the energy saving cooking stores. And then governments also have to make sure that whatever monies they get in terms of energy transition, they have to make a provision to handle clean cooking as a matter of policy, as a matter of uh, regulation, if you plan in that way. Like, for example, in Uganda, we are going to have a loan facility from the World Bank. Part of it is going to Uganda Energy Credit Capitalization Grant to help the refugees. Uganda hosts 1.5 million refugees, and we have the best policy on refugees. And refugees also have an effect on the environment. They cut down trees for cooking and for shelter. So this World Bank facility, which we are getting, we are having about 72 million US dollars to go for the refugees. And we will target clean cooking. So policy is also very important. If you have that policy, 
you can work around it to make sure that every money that you get, you have a portion that goes into clean cooking. And in fact, this, uh, this highlight of forests brings another issue back in, which is indigenous peoples are in many places the stewards of these critical forests. And so there's a justice component. So, Minister, let me bring it back to you for a last comment in terms of, you've heard a lot here, what are some of the opportunities to partner going forward without stealing anything that might be said tomorrow? So. <laughs> no, I, listen, I'm just, uh, it's an honor to share the stage with these folks and I'm very optimistic. I, I am getting the opportunity or my folks have the opportunity to work with everyone on this stage and we're seeing the progress this problem is solvable. And I just hate to say to Dimpna that you might be out of a job soon with all this energy <laughs> on the stage. I, I think whatever hook we can use, we should. And I think the NDC and climate has offered a new opportunity to bring a new light that brings additional revenue streams and financing. And that is fine, but we cannot lose sight that it is solving more than a climate issue. So I think with the energy, the motivation, the creativity, the entrepreneurship, that the folks on this stage are exhibiting, uh, we're gonna solve this problem. Well, I wanna thank the panelists, this is exceptional. I wanna thank the audience. We're gonna do a picture um, stage before people run up and chat with people, but just thank you all for being here and for following through, and thank the, the Cooking Alliance. Thank you everyone for attending. If cool. you could just stay in your seats for one more minute while they're taking their photo. Uh, come back tomorrow, we got a full day here at the US Center. Uh, we've got fast action mitigation to slow warming in this decisive decade. That's at 9 a.m. 10.30, we have U.S. Senators discussing congressional support for climate action. We have open exhibit time, a NASA hyperwall presentation uh, with NASA's chief scientist, Dr. Kate Calvin. We have some great climate conversations lined up for 1 p.m. At 1.30, we have how public-private partnerships are decarbonizing hard-to-abate sectors. 3 o'clock, a recharged U.S. climate and energy landscape. And at 4 o'clock, we have conservative solutions to global climate challenges. At 5.15, we will be live streaming President Biden's remarks when he is here on the ground in Egypt tomorrow. Thank you so much.